Hello, everyone. I'd like to call to order the board of Santa Barbara Unified School District Board of Trustees September 24th meeting. Um, sounds like, looks like there's some um, speaker cards for a closed session item. So we will go to that first before adjourning into closed session. Okay, just going through here. Um, welcome, everybody. And let, let me make sure I get those who are here to speak about closed session. Uh, that would be item B. Four, um, Linda Bonnet. Is that you're here for closed session, correct? Yes. Great. Well, you're welcome to speak, uh, Ms. Bonnet. You have three minutes, and I'll give you a thirty-second warning. So this is. I'm sorry. I should say that the item. Uh, it's B four, which is conference with legal counsel, existing litigation, Fair Education Santa Barbara Inc. versus Santa Barbara Unified School District and Just Community Central Coast. Thank you. Uh, I'm here tonight as a grandmother of three grandsons. Two are in the Santa Barbara school system, and one is still a baby. Um, for those of you have, who haven't seen this chart, uh, according to just uh, communities, these are forms of oppression. The privileged group, men or boys in this case, white people, heterosexual people, traditionally gendered people, Christians or, or kids coming from Christian homes. According to Just Communities, these are the oppressors. My grandsons fit this profile of oppressors. This makes them a target. <laughs> um, all corporate wrongs of the past are being strapped on the backs of our sons and grandsons. We have all come to know that this is considered racist, sexist, and religious bigotry. Because you have approved this Just Communities curriculum, does that mean you condone this bigotry? I have a personal challenge for Superintendent Matsuyoka. Matsuoka. One, please define the word oppression or oppressor according to Just Communities curriculum. And two, how specifically are any of my grandsons oppressing anyone. I know I'm catching you off guard. You don't have to answer the question right now. But I will give you my uh, email address, and I expect by next session in two weeks that you have an answer for me. If you do answer me, I will stand up here and share with everybody what you said. If you don't, I will get up here and say that you didn't. And I will do that every week until you answer me. Now, back to being a target. There's many people groups that have been targets throughout our history. No child should have to be a target because of their sex, because of their, their gender, because of their race, or because of their religious beliefs. Schools should be teaching that no one is 30 a target. Seconds. This is a very American value that should be taught in our schools. Under just communities, apparently, that basic American value isn't being taught. Thank you. Okay. All right, next. Um, I'm, you know, I just really want us to, this is really a, a governance meeting. We don't want any clapping or jeering. We really just want us to stay in order. So, because if we're clapping for this, we have to clap for the boo. So let's just really keep it very uh, amicable, regardless of who's speaking at the podium. Thank you. Okay, next, um, still speaking to closed session items B4 and B6, Sheridan Rosenberg. Hi, thank you. Um, just a quick suggestion. It would be wonderful to have a clock just like this over here because it's even though we have this little one, we're looking up at you and it's a little jarring when you say 30 minutes. It's just 30 seconds. It's just a suggestion. I think it would be great. Um, I, I want to clarify that I'm actually not against 
uh, anti-bias training. I'm against biased anti-bias training. And I think that there is a real opportunity to um, look for or create an alternative to just communities that really strives for mutual respect and mutual understanding. And today I was conversing with Katie Hedden, who was the very courageous teacher who wrote the declaration about her experience at IEE. And I invited her to participate in perhaps joining in a roundtable discussion where we can talk about alternatives that work for everyone. I know that my daughter suffered, and she is the most tender-hearted, sweet little kid, and she wants to go back to Santa Barbara High, but she doesn't feel safe, and she's <coughs> hardly a shrinking violet. She has friends who've left the school who feel the same way. I think what has been done in the past isn't working, so let's find something that works. Now about Mr. Matsuoka, it's awful to ask someone not to have your contract renewed. It actually is painful. I am an employer. I have a business. I've had to fire men with families that didn't work out, and it was brutal. I've had to do tough things. I think that it's getting to the point where it's just not a good fit for anyone, and it would really help our community if perhaps you could consider retiring. It's a good time to spend time with your family. I really felt your pain when you described driving by, um, the, reading about the fire on the boat that was so devastating. And there were families that were from Santa Cruz, from an area where you lived in by a school that you used to drive by every day. And my gut feeling is that you're really, really homesick. And I think it would be helpful if maybe you were able to reflect on what would be best for everyone, including yourself, because it's just not working. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have uh, James Fechner for item B6. There. Hello, Rose. Um, thank you for this opportunity to speak. Um, I'm going to follow uh, in the theme of um, Sheridan. It's a difficult question to ask not to have a contract extended. Um, but uh, there's a number of reasons why we're making this um, case. Uh, the first is academic performance. Um, there's some numbers out. We'd like to ask if we can discuss those earlier rather than later in the public session. Um, we've discussed the, uh, the school facilities. Uh, we've had a $200 million bond um, that's still not fixing uh, many of these problems. Thirdly, um, this I think we can only describe as reckless financial uh, oversight. The $300,000 in missed lunches, that hits um, the budgeting of $7 million deficit. Um, we want a sustainable school system. <clears throat> I think uh, thirdly, I would mention uh, the inadequate community outreach. There, we were we were here one night with Gate. It was really surprised everyone. Um, in terms of communication, as Sheridan mentioned, we are not against anti-bias training. We are very concerned with just communities' uh, rendition of this. Um, and then responsiveness, the Mad Academy um, it really kind of showed people that. Our, our kids are not being protected. And then finally, what I'd argue is, a, is an irresponsible management style. Um, there's a fear of reprisals within this district for people that speak up. And um, that's wrong. Uh, this is a public school district. She, people should be able to come and share their views. So um, there's a petition outstanding. I think we're somewhere where around 330 people have signed it. Um, we want the best for this school district. Um, so that's where we're coming from. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next we have uh, Mr. John Morse, right in B6. Mr. Morse. Good evening. I'm John Morse. I'm a member of Fair Education Santa Barbara. <clears throat> I'm here to oppose the uh, renewal of Mr. Matsuoka's contract. I could talk about some of the reasons, for example, the uh, 
facilities, the Mad Academy, the fact that they've been bucketing money to nonprofits. But other people talk about that. But my point is that at this point, I think you can't kick the can down the road much further. And I was going to say you have a binary choice. You could decide not to renew the contract, in which case you can have a clean break and send a message that this will not be tolerated in the future. You could extend the contract, in which case you could send a message everything's fine. Um, I can almost guarantee that if you extend the contract and you later want to terminate for cause, uh, I can almost guarantee you'd have another lawsuit to talk about in closed session. But it occurs to me that I was, you don't really have a binary choice. You have a third choice, and that is to convince Mr. Matsuoka to retire or resign. I think that would be the best for everybody, and it's a face-saving way out. And I would suggest that you give it serious consideration. Thank you. Thank you. And our last speaker for closed session items is Teresa um, Patino. Did I say your name correctly? I don't, I don't know how to work this out. OK. Oh, OK, thanks a lot. Good evening. I am the parent of a child who attended talking in class last school year, presented by Jazz Communities. I'd like to make a complaint about this three-day course taught in the campus of Santa Barbara Junior High. I signed my child to participate in this three-day program because I was sold with the beautiful idea that Jazz Communities claim are doing, of helping to close the gaps among the students in the schools. Being a moderate Democrat and believing in equal rights, I saw this program as a great opportunity for my child to be involved and to participate in the inclusion of all children. It was not. The first day of that course, my child came home very angry and upset. When I contacted one of the teachers from Jess Communities and told her the state of my child and asked her what was taught in the class, she responded to me by saying that my child said he was a disgrace to his family, that his reaction to the class was deeper than what, that what was said in the classroom. She never told me what was taught in the class that day. Since my child has had medical problems since a baby, I believe her, and I even thank Jess Communities for bringing this up. But as time went on, I realized that that wasn't it. My child was upset because of things Jess Communities teachers say during the course. I find out that during the first day of class, some teachers from Jess Communities presented to the students two graphs. The first graph explained how Caucasian students have a high chance to graduate from college, and how Latino and African Americans have a much lower chance to make it at the university level. Then another graph where they present the different social economic classes of people living in Santa Barbara, and they ask each student where they belong in the graph. I am very concerned from all students, but especially for the message that they are giving, that if you are Latino or African American, you have a low chance of making it in society. When you are 12, 13, or 14 years old, and you hear that from a just community teacher at the school, that you are disadvantaged because of your ethnicity. Is that the message that you want to be giving these kids to encourage them to do good in school? Or is it to get them angry at society? These kids are at a very vulnerable age, and some of them can get very discouraged and affected psychologically from this 30 message. 30 seconds. Making them not to even try to succeed. What every child needs instead is encouragement, support, and love. Know what they are doing to them. Most children at the junior high are too young to be presented with this information. I also have to say that during spring time, my child got a text message from Jess Communities inviting him to go for a hike and bring a friend. I never gave Jess Communities my child's number. Jess Communities had my number, though, and they never contacted me, informing me of such an invitation. Is my child is a minor, is that even legal? Thank you, you need to wrap it up. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please, 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 please. We want to keep. We want to keep order. I'm not trying to get contentious in here. We just want to be order. This is, a, you know, the, our meeting. So, it, that concludes our um, public comment. Yes, it does. Okay. So we will now adjourn to closed session to discuss items B one, two, three, four, five, and six. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. We're going to call us back into.
Homo session, and we will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Matsuoka. Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Buenas tardes. Tenemos interpretación al español por si alguien gusta escuchar la presentación en español. Good evening. We have Spanish interpretation available. Thank you. And headsets for the hearing are available. Please indicate if you should need a headset. A couple announcements from closed session. Uh, the board voted unanimously in closed session to approve case number 2019-2020-SE01 in the amount of 4700 for, excuse me, 47,100. Motion by Ms. Minos, second by Ms. Ford, and the vote was unanimous. Also to let you know that unanimous vote is four as Dr. Reed is absent from this meeting. The board also unanimously voted in closed session to approve a one day unpaid suspension for a classified employee. Motion made by Ms. Capps, second by Ms. Sims Moten, and the vote, vote was unanimous. Thank you. Okay, next we'll go to the superintendent's report. Last Friday, there was uh, quite a, a student um, process of some of our local students being involved in the, the global strike. And, you know, as a school district, we have to find a balance uh, of supporting our students and their First Amendment rights, but also our responsibility to keep kids safe. And um, I was out of town, but I heard that the, the student protests were um, really good, um, safe, yep. uh, and supervised. And just to go on the record, I mean, I agree with the science about climate change. I mean, I'm a scientist. I taught science. Um, but I also have a responsibility to help keep our schools in order and keep them safe. So I think we found a, a nice balance with that. So I'd like to add um, an extended superintendent comments. And I'm going to be reading off of a script. So I apologize for not making eye contact like I normally do. Um, but every word that I've written down is important. So good evening, school board, Santa Barbara Unified staff, and community members. Uh, last week, I had the privilege of participating in a leadership conference with people from all over the country. It was inspiring to hear about all the good work taking pl place in schools and the challenge of creating space for civil discourse in our society. And these were people from all over the country. Our public comment section in our meetings is really important. It's part of what a school board should do. Um, and it's an opportunity to create discourse. And tonight, I'm going to offer some of my comments about the topics that have been raised over the last uh, probably couple of school board meetings, as well as thoughts on my mind as I continue my 40th year in education. First of all, the Williams Act, um, that's an important law. Uh, it's designed to ensure that students have access to appropriate instructional materials and clean, safe facilities. So we've heard concerns raised about facilities over the last probably three to four meetings. And so let me respond to some of those. So the PA system at Dos Pueblos High School, Goleta Valley High School, uh, the contractors are out there. They're pulling the wires. And DP should be operational by the end of October and Goleta Valley sometime mid-November. Um, by the way, as a veteran high school principal, school administrator, a PA system's important. It's valuable for day-to-day -day operations. But in today's 21st century fast-moving world, um, depending on a PA system to communicate with every student and actually now with our community, in a minute or a couple minutes, uh, a PA system isn't going to solve that. So we are implementing Crisis Go. It's an online platform. Um, it's going to tie together staff, parents, our public safety responders, um, our students, um, using the smartphones that virtually everybody has in their pocket. And with that, we will be able to message uh, instantaneously. So we are training our staff. I know that that training happened. I think it was today and ongoing. Second, uh, there's been comments about windows at, I think it's Santa Barbara High School. Um, I want the community to know that we are doing an assessment of all the historic windows at Santa Barbara High School, uh, McKinley, 
Santa Barbara Junior High, and also there's one more, La Cumbra Junior High. Um, we've actually done a pilot at Santa Barbara High School replacing the historic windows with modern fiberglass windows because we want them to last uh, for 50, 60 years. Uh, that assessment is in process, and we will be executing a replacement plan in due time. Third, the complaint about bathrooms at Santa Barbara High School. Um, I actually went out there yesterday and walked through those bathrooms with Principal Elise Simmons, and I viewed the, the setting in which these complaints have come. I saw the toilet stall where complaint has been brought. Um, the reason why that stall is not working is the sewer line isn't working, so we are going to gut and replace that bathroom next summer. My point about replacing that bathroom at this point, if we were to do that, we'd have to rip out all of the concrete, replace it, and then we'd have to do it all over again next summer. So in my opinion, taxpayer dollars are important. We're going to do this all in the summer of 2020 in both bathrooms there. <laughs> That's why we need crisis go. <laughs> at the last school board meeting, there was public comment about the lack of student achievement at three schools, Cleveland, McKinley, and Harding Elementary School. I just want to say I am extremely proud of the staff at these schools, the students at these schools, and we are putting systems in place to bring quality instruction at those three schools, but also at all of our schools. By the way, the speaker did not mention Franklin Elementary. And under the leadership of Principal Casey Kilgore, um, she and the staff have proven that we can achieve excellent academic outcomes in a school that serves high concentrations of low-income students. Adams Elementary has been a model turnaround school for a decade. And last January, Adams was recognized at the National ESEA Conference by the federal government as one of only two schools in California to receive this recognition. We have a lot of work to do in our schools. We know that. You're going to see it in the data report tonight. Um, but we are committed to change the narrative in Santa Barbara Unified. Tonight, you're going to hear about the significant growth at Harding Elementary School under Principal Veronica Binkley, uh, which is another proof point that you can take a school under challenging circumstances and bring about systemic improvements. Tonight, I want to educate our community about the financial challenges that we face in Santa Barbara Unified. So I often get this, oh, you're superintendent in Santa Barbara Unified. What a beautiful place, and it is. The perception is that we are a high wealth district, and we are not. So because of our settings, everyone thinks that Santa Barbara Unified is a wealthy school district. But because we're not, we feel this in every classroom every day in our schools. Uh, a couple weeks ago, maybe it was a month ago, uh, Principal Bill Woodard and Mauricio Ortega, we went and toured Goleta Union Schools because they serve Goleta. And I just wanted to see those schools. Um, it's a really great school district. And I was struck with class sizes, um, you know, the, the, the space that they have. And here's what a big difference. Goleta gets 30% more money than we do. And I saw it live in front of my face. Like, wow, what a difference in our neighboring school district that sends our seventh graders to us. So the largest part of our income comes from local property taxes. Here's the numbers for our four partner districts. Montecito, $32,484 per student. Cold Spring, 28,000, not 625. Goleta Union, 10,145. Hope Elementary, 9,571. Santa Barbara Unified, 7,775. So our closest school district financially is Hope. They receive $1,800 more per student than we do. Goleta Union, $2,370 more per student. And to the other extreme, Montecito receives $24,709 more than we do for every student. We feel this, again, I say this, we feel it every day in our classrooms and in our schools. And as a public school district, we do our best to educate every student who walks in our doors into our schools with the resources that our community provides. I'm really proud of the staff on uh, Santa Barbara Unified as we work to hard to overcome the challenges that we face uh, and work in the lowest funded school district in our city. 
So yes, we have problems to solve in Santa Barbara Unified. The first step in solving a problem is to recognize there is one. I started my comments with an appeal to civil discourse and focusing on what we can do together to support all of our students. One of the fundamental challenges we face in Santa Barbara Unified is funding. And I will be asking the school board for direction about next steps when it comes to helping the, the funding inequities in our school district. So those are my comments tonight. Thank you for listening to me. Board, any comments or? Ms. No, I just, did you have, okay, any comments? So thank you, Mr. Matsuoka, uh, for that report. So board comments and correspondence. Ms. Ford. Are you sure? <laughs> Oh, thank you. Uh, first of all, um, I had the distinct pleasure to attend a number of back to school nights since the last board meeting. And I'm uh, so happy that our principals and members of the PTA and adjunct kinds of uh, services to our schools are able to highlight not only the schools, but also just really increase parent knowledge and engagement. I went to La Cumbra, Santa Barbara High School, Washington and McKinley. I also just wanted to mention that along with um, Ms. Sims Moten, I was able to have a wonderful opportunity of visiting the Dos Pueblos Engineering Academy. Mm. And um, we were hosted by Amir and Emily Scher. And it was uh, especially, I would say, given my sort of nerdy, very uh, intense interest in artificial intelligence and robotics, um, I just felt like it was an opportunity to be a real ardent supporter of programs that engage and inspire students and also connect them to the world of work and schools. Um, also, with Ms. Caps, I attended last week a, a sort of a celebration of people's self-help housing. This is an organization that's been around 50 years. And it just was so inspiring to see what an organization can do to uh, empower people to build their own homes and to be a part of their community, a, a distinct and um, a very intense part of their community, and also just the wraparound services that they provide for all of the resident children. It was lovely. And finally, um, I, maybe you know it, but I'll just announce that today is National Voter Registration Day. And um, I say, given everything that's happening in our co country and also local, locally, um, this is the time to be very aware that local and state and national elections are looming. And I hope everyone in this room who is over 18 has registered to vote. And if not, get on it. Thank you. Kips. Thank you. I also attended the climate strike and was so inspired. Uh, a couple hundred, mostly students out there at De La Guerra Plaza, just they're awake. They're trying to wake up the rest of the world, and it was so palpable. I was pleased with how the district handled it. Uh, in particular, uh, Lito Garcia, the principal of Santa Barbara Junior High, I was there with him, and he had walked over with a few of his uh, uh, colleagues to make sure that the 57 students from Santa Barbara Junior High who decided to participate were able to do it safely and um, of course it was an, an unexcused absence so they understood that but that's really what protesting is and um, I'm just forever proud of our community for being so activist uh, activated about um, climate and environmentalism and for our students to be leading the charge uh, was inspiring so thank you for your comments on that and also um, I had the chance to be out at uh, Dos Pueblos Engineering Academy and um, unlike Ms. Ford I only, only understood a little bit of what um, <laughs> I was being shown but at rapid fire pace they can talk really fast but it's just a, a, um, a great place to be and even though I'd been there just a couple years before to see the growth and to see all the excitement at the time I was there there were students from Goleta Union uh, a Goleta school being taught they were third graders, I believe, being taught by the 11th graders what they were doing on the machine. So just a great example. So thank you. Ms. Minos. Yes, I also wanted to say, you know, how much I enjoyed the uh, back to school nights with my fellow board members and meeting all the parents and the uh, children. I went to the La Cumbre Junior High uh, back to school night and also the McKinley uh, back to school night last night. Um, very, you know, very happy to see also the the um, 
the, prince, the new principal at McKinley um, who really connects with the parents and seeing her presentation in English and Spanish to all of our families uh, there. And I also, I'm looking forward to going to the DP Engineering Academy uh, this coming Friday and trying to see, you know, understand that as much as I can, <laughs> not technical per se, and, um, and, and looking forward to that. And then yesterday, uh, during the day, I attended the uh, Multilingual Pathways meeting, um, the all-day meeting that was just, just amazing. I mean, beyond amazing in terms of participation from uh, school staff, from the students themselves, from um, the parents, uh, English and Spanish speaking, and just the, the dream, um, just seeing it, uh, be, how we're gonna make it become reality to have uh, multiple languages and cultures uh, with our students. And we were looking at how long the implementation should take and just, you know, in terms of comparison, just in terms of a little bit of a detail and how you know four to six years versus like eight years and just making it part of an education uh, for our for our students and and their you know capacity to learn two or three languages since a young age is just amazing um, so I look forward to continuing with the workshops um, and attending those through our goal is January gosh I think it's January 11th is the last a workshop so just you know very excited about that um, at La Cumbre Junior High I also met the students with the PEAK program the mm -hmm. let's see pro, bear with me program for effective access to college and learned about that and I you know um, young staff that is just you know in terms of the partnership there and, and mentoring our students to be successful and and looking at the possibility of going to college and just having that support is just amazing so yeah Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'll just round us out tonight. So <laughs> just in terms, of, I did have the opportunity to, as Ms. Board stated, to, to attend the DPEA. And I uh, agree with the comments made by both her and Ms. Kepps. But the other thing I, I saw in that, along with all the things that were working, they had some cool jump shoots, jumpsuits going on. But more importantly, the relationships that were being formed in terms of the students, you know, mentoring the younger students and how you just see them really, uh, really engaged with the students, both the student who was learning, I think they were third graders from Adams when we were there. And you just see the interaction between them and, the, and just the bright eyedness. And so I appreciated that and how important that is uh, and all the things that we do, that relationships that are built in, at a young age and how important it is as they go through and feeling like they're contributing both for the high school students who were really helping and supporting our younger students and you could see that they could they were aspiring to be in that position as well so I appreciated that aspect of it um, as well um, there's one thing that I wanted to talk about tonight that is not often talked about is about when there is a successful engagement with a parent a teacher and a student um, I was at my hairdresser, no less, uh, when this interaction went along. And um, so what happened was a student had come home and was upset and disappointed and confused by an interaction with her teacher. And so naturally, she shared that with her mom. And so I think we as mom and folks who love our kids and uh, nieces and nephews, we go to that defense mode, like, what happened? You know, I'm sorry to see that way. And so they talked about it. And so the mom started to draft an email to the teacher. Uh, and um, and she was just kind of sharing, you know, her concerns, you know, talking out loud with it. And um, she was like, I'm just going to respond based on what her student had just told her. So when we got a chance to kind of talk it through, and I had a permission to share this anyway. So um, we had a chance to talk it through. And I was like, well, perhaps you might want to call the student and let her know that you're going to call the teacher. So is there anything you left out? that I need to know before I, you know, interact with the teacher. So she did call her, her daughter, and there was a little bit of information that needed to be included that wasn't for you to include it. So what that did was um, it held the student accountable, and then it made for a much more informed interaction as opposed to an emotional reaction to the teacher, right? And so uh, the teacher and I want to just, you know, give kudos. She responded right away to the parents' email. They had a talk. They also then talked about a plan so that the student wouldn't feel confused, wouldn't feel disillusioned, disappointed, all of those things. It could have went so far the other way, but I appreciate how all three of them worked together to make sure that there was a successful plan um, for the student. And as it turned out, and I appreciated the final comment from the uh, parent to her daughter to say, you know, your teacher's working really hard to make sure that you're successful. And so when you you just kind of discount
counter, don't do it. I say I forgot. What do you think that makes, how do you think that makes her feel? And so her, I, I understand. And so I have no doubt that she will be much you know, more successful in her class having been heard, that her teacher responded to, and the parent. So working that, we don't often hear that, that every day this type of stuff is going on in our schools to make our schools better. And it's important that, that we say that. It's important that that is up front because there's a lot of hard work going on to make this school district the best that it can be. Now, there are things that we do wrong. Don't need to keep telling us. But, and we recognize that and we own that. But every day, I, I guarantee you 90% of that, the work of the teachers, the students, and the parents to make it the best that it can be, doing the best with what they have to be able to do that. That's 90% of what goes on. There's 10% that's, that we need to pay attention to, but I want to start paying attention to 90% of what's the hard work that's going on every day from our students, from our parents, and from our teachers. It really inspired me to say, that's what we want to hear. And when we and appreciate that, when we're having to work through civil discord, that was an example of how if you're listening to each other, you can get to the center and you do not lose focus as to what you're working for. And this focus of that conversation and as well as the conversation that everyone in here, everyone in here really wants the best for their students. But how we get there is that we've got to listen, we've got to be engaged with each other, we've got to be respectful to each other and we'll get there. So I just needed to say that because that is not often a conversation that we hear or that's acknowledged. Mm -hmm. So now we will move to our public comment section. I just want to say again with regards to our public comment, we want to again keep, make sure that we're respectful. Everyone has something to say because it's really about everybody cares about their students and want to make sure that we're doing the best for them. We want to make sure that we hear each other respectfully so that, you know, because we start shouting or saying personal attacks either, your defenses come up and you're not able to really hear what, what's needing to be said. So I want to make sure that we maintain our our uh, respectfulness in this and uh, you know we want to not have the clapping and the jeering we want to be able to hear it respectfully so we can be about the business of making sure our students are we're preparing them for a world that's yet to be created Ms. Caps. all right so we have um, about 20 uh, public speakers for general um, comment so that we um, just to give some of the process we allow three minutes per person so Doing the math, that would be about an hour. You're welcome to do less, of course. Just wanted to make that point so that um, we can move things along. I'm also going to be naming three people at a time so that you can kind of get ready so that there's less lag time in between. And just in the spirit of this, I know it got kind of heated last, uh, last meeting. We are listening. We're listening to you empathetically. And we are here because we represent the community and the voice of the community. Um, we can't comment on each speaker. I know there was some frustration about that last meeting, which I wish I had addressed, but according to the Brown Act, we need to only comment and react to things that are agendized. So just to explain that to you all, but we are, we are listening and we welcome you and we welcome a robust public comment. So with that, I'm going to welcome to the microphone, Mickey Hamill, followed by Luciana Crochia, followed by Moni. And I'll be giving a 30 second warning. I try to do it as nicely as possible. Um, uh, when you have 30 seconds left. Thanks. Okay, so um, I'm, I, I was just given this table today. Um, it's the um, Just Communities curriculum. It's, it's got forms of oppression and privilege group, target group, and then it lists what they are. And it just looks like um, it is a clear um, that's based on this table that the um, students and the teachers are being taught, I think, to be racist. The school district encourages, I mean, with this program, negative stereotypes directed at certain people they refer to as privileged oppressors. Um, the stereotypes are monolithic and dangerous to young impressionable minds. This type of thinking was actually prevalent during the last century in the American South and the attitudes and actions towards the black population. The school board has now institutionalized the teaching of this same stereotypical behavior. There are moral and legal consequences to these misguided teachings from just communities. My son has been assaulted because of the color of his skin. My friend's daughter is white and is, and is, is terrorized by students of color because she is white. Some of them used to be her friends. Many parents can see that Just Communities is partially responsible for these students, for these students' racist, violent actions. Why such secrecy with regards 
to the curriculum. The school board hides the program. They keep it in the dark because they know it will not stand up to scrutiny. The general, um, the general population and citizenry would, citizenry would not stand for it. Just to end, 56 years ago, we learned as a nation from a great American leader, Martin Luther King, a Christian who said, and I quote, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where, there will not be, where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. The US has made great strides in the area of race relations during the last 70 years. Let us not black, backslide now into the evils of teaching racism, the essence of Just Communities curriculum. Thank you. Luciana Garcia, again followed by Moni DeWitt, followed by Max Rorty. Hello, thank you for having me again. Uh, I am a parent of a dyslexic kid, if you all remember me, I was here last time speaking, so I'm here again uh, just to get that uh, beautiful wave that's coming in as a pro protest. So I want to do a little protest too. Uh, a year, almost a year has been passed since the last time I was here, and I don't see any changes. You know, the school uh, still is unprepared. Uh, the special education program that's in place is still uh, not addressing uh, the problem. It's just brushing it, and my daughter is still suffering at school. Uh, not just her. I see her, there is other kids there uh, suffering as well. So again, this, the school is not prepared. Uh, you know, they change principles, they change programs, uh, but nothing is effective. Okay, the challenge the challenge that she is encountering in school is still there. Uh, we have covered that many times with the IEP meetings with like the psychologists, principal, teachers. They don't know what they are doing. The teacher is not prepared. The teacher doesn't know what dyslexia is. The teacher doesn't know how to talk with those kids. Okay, just to give an example. Uh, in one of the meetings with the, stu the, the teacher, teacher night or parents night, the teacher told us that she doesn't know how to grade my, my kid. So that's just to give an idea how we use the things. They don't know what they are doing. So if you cannot grade her, you cannot teach her, and we are failing her. So that's my view. Um, all the uh, recommendations from other experts, you know, like what she needs in case, and then specific to my daughter that has uh, talked with all those professionals, like she needs uh, to get out of the black and white. She needs to have like a different vision of the content. She needs to have a one-on-one -on -one approach. Nothing like, nothing that happens. We don't have staff to do one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, the special educator there is never one-on-one. -on -one. And, and we are still pushing black and white something that she cannot read, and it's getting worse and worse because she's losing content. She is then on the stage now that she's supposed to get content, and she's missing it because we are not talking her language. We're still pushing her to read black and white, and we all know that she cannot read. She's still behind. 30 seconds. So I'm here again to beg you, Mr. Superintendent, you have the power to do something, so please, do something on the special education program because what you're doing now is not working and hasn't been working for a while. I'm struggling with my daughter at Washington School since she was on the second grade. It has been four years. She's on the sixth grade now. She's ready to leave and she's still behind and we did not what we are supposed to do for her Thank and I guarantee you we are not doing it for the other kids as well. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Moni DeWitt, followed by Max Rorty, followed by Lena Melendez. So hi, board and uh, Mr. Matsuoko. And thank you, Luciano, for being so brave to come again and tell us your story. Because although, Mr. Matsuoko, you indicated that um, the main problems are awareness and funding, it actually goes a lot deeper. You know, besides awareness, you need focus and we need action. And if you don't believe me, you can listen to Shally, Sally Shaywitz from the Yale Center for Dyslexia and Social Justice 
says the same thing. She talks to about this in front of Congress. And um, you can go right down the street. You don't even have to go to Aspen and run down our funding. You can go to Marsha Wolf at the UCLA Center for Dyslexia and Social Justice. And I, too, am struck by the, by the disparity here in our district. I know Laura Capps, you know all the kids at Cleveland, Franklin, Harding, the food bank. They're in deep poverty. And yet, those kids are failing. And, and we're not saying this because we don't think it's a teacher's problem. We think, actually, that it is, starts at the top. And you know, if you want people to not feel implicit bias, then you need to have the Hispanic group be able to take the A through Gs. They need to have literacy by the third grade. And there are key steps you can do to that. You can make assessments. You can live up to your child to find assessments and one-on-one -on -one interventions. Those pull-out programs aren't effective. And I know this because I'm dyslexic. My son is dyslexic, and as I've mentioned many times, the district here did not provide the appropriate intervention. They wanted to do like 15-minute pullouts with other children, and my son needed intensive intervention. And what wound up helping him was an aid that my husband and I paid for for four hours a day. Um, and two intensive summer interventions with a trained reading specialist. I know Sherry Ray has told you about this, and I think she kind of got thrown under the bus, which I'm personally sad about. And I think our community suffered a loss there, but she still keeps helping out the fallout. Last week, she came and talked about another person, just like Luciano, at a school. And we told you they were parked in front of a computer for four hours, had made no progress, and your leader, Ms. Croc, thought it was fine. And no one here called Sherry back. She's working for nothing helping this kid. That's what's going on. And if funding is such an 30 issue. 30 seconds. OK, $40 million football field, 2.65 for our armory. Give the armory to the police station and focus on literacy. Literacy is what we deserve. And if you're so worried about stop giving, you know, you want to make the Latinx feel respected, then don't give them bad gestures when they come to speak about Ed Barron's. You know, give them the A through G, like, and, and stop celebrating the white and Asians. It's embarrassing. Start taking care of the needs of the Latinx and the people with learning differences. Wake up, really. Thank you. Next we have. Just a reminder, let's not have any of that, please. Thank you. Max Rorty. Thank you. Welcome. Followed by Lena Melendez, followed by Celine Abate. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to start with a personal story, and then I'm going to talk about the work that I do, and then I'm going to talk about uh, why I think Just Communities programming is so important. Um, my personal story is about this time that I had a one-year-old at home, and my um, uh, graduate thesis advisor drove from San Francisco to get a hotel room so my wife and I could go see the movie Carol. And we put the one-year-old in the hotel room, and we went and saw the movie. And I don't know if you've seen it, but it involves lots of very beautiful dresses and a woman who's in love with a married woman and a gun. And we watched the movie on the edge of our seats. And then we got to the end of it and couldn't believe it and drove to the hotel, threw open the door, screamed. She said, did you see it? And we said, we saw it. And we jumped up and down and woke up the baby because nobody died. I was 40 when I saw a movie with gay people that didn't die. Every movie that has ever won an Oscar with a gay person in it, Brokeback Mountain, Philadelphia, Milk, every movie with any women who have ever had anything to do with each other, talking to each other for more than 15 minutes, set it off, fried green tomatoes, Thelma and Louise, they die. I'm a therapist now at neighborhood clinics, and yesterday with my student intern, I met with a woman who's terrified that her 17-year-old daughter is going to kill herself and she's not telling anybody this except for me because she's ashamed that her daughter is attracted to both girls and boys at age 17. She can't tell anybody in the family. She's not letting her daughter tell anybody because they don't know anybody like that. And if all that they had access to was movies, 
they would be right in thinking that it's not safe to tell anybody. But in this district, they have access to Just Communities curriculum, which is life saving. Please be respectful of the person who has the time on the mic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lena Melendez, followed by Carolyn Abate, followed by Quinn Stefan. Okay. Hello, my name is Lena Melendez, and I have a eighth grader at Goleta Valley Junior High. And I came last year also to speak about her, and I had a a lot of optimism. We were coming from Santa Barbara Charter School to um, SB Unified. And some things have gone well, and some things not so much. And I do want to thank Mrs. Clancy Chu and Mr. Ortega, our administrators, because they're very responsive to all of my communications with them, and they do seem very interested in my daughter. Um, but the frustration I've come to talk to you about today is about assistive technology. And so um, in her elementary school years, we knew that she needed assistive technology because she really is behind with her reading. She's dyslexic and probably, I think she's at about a third grade level, which is not adequate at eighth grade or seventh or eighth grade to keep up with social studies, science, you know, even reading the math problems. It's all written, right? So because we weren't sure which programs we would need, and we're very grateful to have the iPad, thank you. <laughs> um, so I asked for an assistive technology assessment, a formal assessment. And I thought we would have somebody from the district come to do it. But in fact, there wasn't somebody. Um, our special education teacher was sent to a training, kind of urgently, I guess, at SELPA. And she was surprised. She indicated to me that this was she hadn't had this training before. And so she came back and did the assessment. She learned through SELPA the assessments. But she, the, the result was, oh, she needs assistive technology. Well, we already knew that. And so there wasn't any real meaningful recommendations to go off of. And so, and this took half the school year, by the way. Just, I requested at the beginning and at the end, mid-year, mid we got the assessment. And I'm very thankful to Jody Stevens for doing it. But um, anyway, so I asked for a, an outside agency to do it because there's so much, you know, the apps and everything are changing so frequently. It, we really needed somebody with experience and um, some practical knowledge about the programs itself. 30 seconds. Okay. Um, anyway, so she was supposed to be trained on these apps. They're still not on her iPad. Um, Mr. Shetler um, called me today to let me know that they're working on it still. And this was last year that I requested these apps to be implemented. So I think our district needs somebody who is an assistive technology specialist, not just our teachers They would have a little bit of training. It needs to be somebody with experience and um, experience. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, Carolyn Abate. Followed by Quinn Stefan. Followed by Sky Adams. Good evening, school board members, and thank you for allowing me to speak with you. This is my fourth presentation regarding why the Just Communities programs in our schools needs to be stopped because they are harmful to our students and our community. The purpose of a school is to graduate students who are academically proficient in reading, spelling, science, math, history, social studies, etc. But how does teaching that racism is a system of oppression based on race that privileges white people and targets, quote, people of color, help struggling students get a better grade on their math test or spelling test? How does dividing everyone into categories of oppression, privileged group, target groups, men targeting women, white people targeting, quote, people of color, wealthy people targeting working class Christians targeting others, do anything to help students understand the importance of turning in their homework, being motivated to study for their chemistry test, their algebra test, or practice their band instrument. 
How does teaching that adults are a privileged group that targets youth and elders for oppression do anything to help students be more respectful to their teachers and follow directions? The answer is, it is not helpful. And in fact, the only time that it does not cause animosity, disrespect, or any other kind of problem is when these ideas, which have no basis in reality, are not taken seriously. Because imagine what would happen if they were. As members of the school board, you are responsible for ensuring that all staff training, school curriculums, and activities promote and support graduating academically proficient students who are respectful, kind, patriotic, and hardworking. Allowing these ideas into our schools is a failure of your duty to maintain the purpose of a school. I have witnessed on multiple occasions people speaking at this podium requesting that Just Communities materials be made available for public inspection. Please let the public record show yet another request being made for full disclosure of all Just Communities materials. I understand the materials are not owned by the school. However, please recall that public schools are taxpayer funded. And as a taxpayer, I have the right to see what I have been forced to purchase. Furthermore, students are not the property of the state seconds. of California, and schools should never be allowed to have exclusive conversations with students, not allowing parents and the public to be allowed to know every last bit of exactly what is being taught. I know you cannot respond at this time during public comment, but perhaps the board could speak to this as an agenda item at the next meeting. Thank you for being willing to consider this request. Thank you. Quinn Stefan, followed by Sky Adams, followed by Sid Abad. Hello, members of the school board. My name is Quinn Stefan. I am a junior at Dos Pueblos High School, but I am speaking to you today on behalf of the Santa Barbara Youth Council. I am the current chair of the Youth Council, an advisory board to the City Council, which promotes the youth voice in the community. Since we as students spend so much of our time in the schools, we at the Youth Council wanted to continue our communication with you on the school board so we can act as some representatives of the youth in Santa Barbara. Um, as a Youth Council this year, currently we have four new Youth Council members, six returning members, and four new junior high members. We have just completed the open recruitment today for the five remaining spots, and this is for um, all the public schools and the private schools and alternative schools in the district. Um, while our youth council year began with the school year, in July I had the opportunity to go with another youth council member and the mayor of Santa Barbara to the inaugural Mayor's National Youth Summit in Los Angeles. It was an incredible experience where we met with other youth involved in local government as well as mayors from around the country to help support each other as active members in our respective communities. Some projects we at the Youth Council are currently working on are an anti-youth vaping public service announcement for the Santa Barbara County Public Health Department and a youth-led candidates forum in October for the Santa Barbara City Council. From what I've seen so far, the current Youth Council brings high levels of engagement and excitement that I know will be beneficial this year. And I look forward to working with them and keeping you updated on our projects as we move through the Youth Council and school year. Thank you. Thank you. Sky Adams. Followed by Sid Abad. Followed by Jennifer Hale. Good evening. My name is Sky Adams. I teach computer science at Santa Barbara High School and Santa Barbara Junior High School. And I'd like to share with you some of my experiences with Just Communities. In 2018, I decided to attend their week-long Institute for Equity in Education. And I was nervous about this because I was worried that I was gonna be spending all week being blamed for systemic problems. But I had so many glowing reviews from colleagues that I decided I should go and try to keep an open mind and see what this was. So during that week that I spent with educators from um, around Santa Maria and Santa Barbara, 
There was no blaming at all. We were focused on understanding the systems of inequality in our education system and looking at how we could start to solve these problems. So I came back with tools that I could start using with my students right away to help them learn better. So I started looking at my curriculum, my examples, and seeing could I make this more relevant to my students? Um, could I tie into their culture and how their daily lives work? I also started to highlight more of diversity in computer science. I want all my students to have a role model, a mirror, someone who looks like them and is successful so that they have someone to look to when they're thinking about their career paths. At the same time, I had tools to now start teaching about the challenges that these people faced so that all my students could understand this problem and start to be part of the solution to it, to open up computer science to everyone. In addition to giving me these tools, Just Communities is promoting students working together and learning together. A lot of the learning in my classroom doesn't happen from me telling my students what they need to know. It's a lot of collaboration and learning from each other. So when some students don't have what they need to thrive, then all of our students are getting a lower education. So Just Communities Programs is helping us as teachers help all of our students get a better education. Thank you. Thank you. Sidabat. I think I'm, you can always correct me if I'm saying your name incorrectly. <laughs> okay, good. Followed by Jennifer Hale, followed by <laughs> Ulysses, I believe, <clears throat> Carbena. Right. Hello, my name is Sid Abad. Um, I graduated from Dos Pueblos High School in 2018, and I now study political science at Santa Barbara City College. I currently hold the position of student advocate in my college's associated student government, and I've been involved with many nonprofit organizations, including Just Communities. I learned of Just Communities when I was recommended to attend their Talking in Class for Safe Schools program by my assistant principal during my junior year of high school. I went through the program and made tons of friends while also learning about and discussing important topics that haven't been brought to my attention before. As a man who is half white and half Filipino, an American citizen, and has the ability to attend college, I have many privileges. Just Communities encourages discussion regarding privileges because those who have privileges rarely need to think of them and therefore are never required to acknowledge their power. I don't think about sexual predators stalking me at night. I don't fear that I'll never see my mom or dad again due to deportation. I have a greater chance of being safely confronted by police due to my light skin. Since I have been taught what my privileges are, I've also been taught how to use them appropriately. Just Communities taught me that I should not feel guilty for having privileges, but I should be proud of who I am and use my lux of privilege to help dismantle prejudice and systems of oppression. Whether that means becoming more aware of what dangers other people around me face or speaking up for people when I see unjust actions being thrown at them, in no way has Just Communities ever implied to me that my privilege made me inferior or superior to anybody else. Just Communities taught me that privilege is a power that should not be abused, but should be to better our world and promote equity. As a queer identified son of a Filipino immigrant, I also understand that no social equality movement has been successful without some sort of allyship from people with privilege. Just Communities does not condone hate towards anybody. Ripping Just Communities from the Santa Barbara Unified School District is asking for our youth to not only miss out on building critical leadership skills, but it silences many of us who don't have advocacy skills. Threatening Just Communities is oppressive to us because it's only taking away a resource that gives the students a way to speak out and change the system that has held us back for so long. In a perfect world, I personally feel like more of our school funds should be distributed towards educating our youth through programs and activities regarding treating people like people and standing up against injustices because it's clear that most of us were never taught that at home. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer Hale, welcome. Followed by Ulysses Carbona, followed by Sherry Ray. Hello, thank you board for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the important work being done in our schools by Just Communities. I'm a parent of a fourth grader and a seventh grader and I've spent countless hours in the classroom both as a volunteer and as a paid employee. 
In 2018, I attended an implicit bias workshop for parents facilitated by Jared and the team at Just Communities. The workshop provided an opportunity for parents of all backgrounds to openly share their experiences and that of their children in various school settings. It created a positive and supportive environment to really listen to one another's perspectives and to hear examples and stories of how bias and inequity in the classroom hurts our children. For the 25 or so parents in that powerful workshop, it created a bridge across the racial divide that is not easily come by, but is essential for comprehending the experiences of those around us. I took away from the workshop a greater understanding of my own implicit bias and how it shapes the position from which I view the world. I gained tips and ideas on how to use this awareness in my own interactions, and just as importantly, how to talk to my kids about implicit bias and the impact that it has on them and their peers. I wholeheartedly support Just Communities. I appreciate that our students, our staff, and our parents of all backgrounds have, this, have access to this invaluable resource that's working to create a positive, equitable learning environment in all of our schools. Thank you. Thank you. Ulysses Carbona. Um, hi, my name is Ulysses Carrera. Sorry, I just couldn't <laughs> um, It's name. okay. <laughs> uh, I have kind of messy handwriting. <laughs> and I just wanted to speak on behalf of Just Communities and my experience overall. So this past summer, I attended CLI, the Community Leadership Institute. Um, and I essentially going in, I was feeling kind of nervous. Um, I just, sorry, I'm getting kind of getting the GVs up here. Um, but I quite honestly did not want to go. <laughs> um, but my friend had told me a lot of great stuff about it. And so I decided, you know what? I'm going to give it a chance. And within, I would say, an hour, I just formed my family. And I understand that while we do have a blood family, we also have a family that we create ourselves. And I believe that I found my family. Um, this family really helped me shape who I am today. Uh, the old me would not be able to stand up here and defend what I believe. Um, but obviously, we see the new me is um, proud and ready for more change um, and to inspire more change, which is something that the Institute did for me. It really helped me shape who I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. And with that, I gained a lot of power. And going in, I really did feel powerless, being a queer, brown, low-income person. Um, but coming out of the Institute, I realized the power that I have and the voice that I have and how I can really change things up. And with that, I wanted to push back on the idea that Just Communities doesn't benefit students in any way. And I would like to say that it has benefited me in terms of my academics. My science grades have gone up. My math tests have gone up um, because I am inspired and I'm ready to inspire change and to help in any way that I can. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Sherry Ray, followed by uh, Kim Pasquez. Pasquez. I, know you, I know you, but I can't pronounce your last name. And John Morse. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. My name is Sherry Ray. I'm the author of Dyslexia Land, the parent of a dyslexic son, an advocate for other students, the director of the Dyslexia Project, and a former dyslexia consultant with this school district. Dyslexia is not rocket science, and it's time to stop acting as if it is. I spent last week with my dad, a retired aerospace engineer, who designed navigation systems for the Apollo moon landings, among other challenging tasks. He is a complex problem solver by nature and by profession. He is brilliant. When we spoke about my decade of dyslexia advocacy and how the fight is never ending, he was simply baffled. To him, you define the issue, you figure out how to address it, and then you implement the solution. That's how it works for rocket sci scientists, I tried to explain, but not for the education community, where dyslexia is treated as an unsolvable mystery as big as the universe. It's not. 
There's been so much research on dyslexia since the 1930s, but it doesn't get into the classroom. Just last week, billionaire Santa Barbara High School alumnus Charles Schwab made a donation of $20 million to the University of San Francisco and the University of California, Berkeley, for a multidisciplinary project to study dyslexia. So they will join the Yale Center for Dyslexia and Creativity, the UCLA Center for Dyslexia, Diverse Learning, and Social Justice, and several other academic centers across the nation where brilliant researchers do their work. What we're left to contemplate is why, when the data is there, the education establishment insists on using less than effective approaches, clinging to and investing endlessly in the discredited balanced literacy reading instruction instead of this implementing the science of reading, and forcing dyslexic students into inferior special education services that require parents to beg for help for their dyslexic children year after year. Charles Schwab was one of the lucky ones. The 1955 graduate from Santa Barbara High was born into a wealthy family and admitted to Stanford on a legacy. So when he repeatedly flunked out of English and French classes, it didn't matter much. We can only wonder how many dyslexic innovators and potential successes like Charles Schwab have been lost over the decades in this school district because they didn't have access to the kind of resources and influence that he did. 30 seconds. When my own son graduated from Santa Barbara High in 2015, exactly 60 years after Schwab, you might have expected that dyslexia would have improved by then, the services. Um, actually, I have to say that if it hadn't been for the help of uh, John Becchio and um, a great deal of advocacy and support, uh, I don't think my son would have ever gotten through Santa Barbara High School. But it's really not rocket science for a school district to successfully address dyslexia, but it still remains a mystery in this district. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Kim Pasquitz. I'm sorry. Reminder, I please. I, you know, I, I know it's hot in here. Sometimes we just, just a reminder to be, be respectful. And Kim, if you don't mind pronouncing your last name, that would be great. <laughs> Pasquage. Pasquage. Yeah. Thank you. And followed by John Morse. Good evening. I am a white parent who participated in a Just Communities PETA program at Adelante Charter School. My son is currently at Santa Barbara Junior High and my daughter attends Adelante. Our PETA group was one of the most impactful experiences and continues to save our school today. We connected with each other through very personal stories from participants of their firsthand experiences, and PETA worked to give everyone an equal voice. Together, we identified areas at our school that we wanted to see change. At the end of our time, over 10 weeks, we had created a better, stronger, and more unified community where all parents had a say in the practices and direction of our school. PETA was so empowering and made us stronger. The goal for just communities and hopefully all communities is that we make space for everyone to have a voice at the table. We succeed when we promote inclusive and equitable opportunities for all for all of our students, parents, teachers, and staff. I wholeheartedly support the work of just communities, and they are invaluable to the training that must happen at all levels of our school district. Just Communities has been accused of being anti-white, which I have never seen or experienced during my time in PETA and other Just Communities events. All voices are welcome. The Santa Barbara School Board must serve and protect the interests of all people in our community, and Just Communities aligns with that vision and mission. I am grateful to Santa Barbara Unified for recognizing and employing the services of Just Communities to continue to bring all voices to the table to empower and mobilize the breadth and beauty of all that we are and all that we can become. Thank you. John Morse. Followed by Barbara uh, Bastini. Followed by Tr Teresa Patino, I think. Good evening. I'm John Morse from, I'm a member of Fair Education Santa Barbara. I'm here tonight to address the latest Williams Act complaint we filed concerning the windows at Santa Barbara High, and I'm concerned that the res from the response, the district doesn't seem to be taking it seriously as they should. They incorrectly characterized the uh, complaint as pertaining to the window panes, and in fact, the complaint pertains to the windows themselves and expressly states that many of the windows are inoperable, preventing egress in an emergency situation. 
And we cannot accept the representation the matter is already being addressed by the district. As of March 2019, according to the Measure I documents, several million dollars have been allocated and spent on the stadium. But as of that date, not one dollar had been allocated for the window replacement, even though the funds have been allocated years ago. And secondly, the district's the letter states that the district anticipates that the project will commence on at least one of five separate schools in the summer of 2020. I would suggest to you, to the extent it's a safety hazard, that's not an acceptable response. To the extent these windows can't be opened, that's a serious safety hazard. And somebody could get seriously hurt or killed if they're unable to exit in the case of a school shooting or a fire. As a bare minimum, it's essential that the windows be checked to make sure they can be opened. And if they can't be opened, that the problem be corrected immediately. Thank you. Barbara, uh, Bat I can't read your handwriting. Bat Battistini, I believe. Dear Supervisor, uh, supervisor and board members, I'm here today as a parent, a grandparent, a former teacher at Santa Barbara School District, and a third generation living in Santa Barbara. I have a great concern when I begin to read um, the, the workbook, Relationship Wisdom, written by Jeff Jennifer Freed, who as a professional is a psychological astrologist or someone that tells fortunes with a d degree in psychology. This is her book. I ask the question. What is an uncredentialed fortune teller doing in the classrooms or an after school program? I wonder how many parents know her origins and would feel comfortable with an astrologist giving their children her sexual wisdom. How many of you on the board have even looked at this material? Let me um, show, um, show you and get my point across. This is a training journal which is invading the privacy of our junior high, high school students, invading them on an emotional and sexual level. And this is the book. If you haven't read it, you all need to take a look at it. So it's very shocking for me to even read this, but I'm gonna quickly um, jump into it real quick. So in case you haven't taken the time, um, I know our tax money goes to pay for this and our children are being exposed to it. Defining values, take the following subjects and rate each one based on its importance to you. Virginity, oral sex, masturbation, courtship, birth control, intercourse, sexual experimentation. What challenges do you feel when thinking about sharing your sexual beliefs and values with others? How do you feel about reading and writing sexually explicit, explicit words in which they encourage the kids to do and write about? What have I learned? Kissing, fondling. Okay, so this is part of the section of under what have I learned. I'm just gonna read some of the words that they use and they have to identify these. Kissing, fondling, age of first ex sexual experience, how long to want to have sex, having sex, men and sex, women and sex. Journal invitations, select one or two of the most powerful messages you've received af about engaging in foreplay or sexual fondling, <laughs> write about how you got those messages. 30 seconds. Draw a simple picture depicting a struggle, an agreement, a script. This script comes from their parents. Write about what happens in your mind and body when you sexually are attracted to somebody. So I'm asking all of you to not fund this with our taxpayer money. I think parents should know what's going on and we'll do our best to expose it. Pick your favorite love scene or sex scene from a movie or TV program and write down what you loved about it. List all these four ways it was the hottest or best scene you can think of. Thank you very much. Okay, Teresa Patino, followed by Cressida Silves, followed by Deirdre Smith. Good evening. 
Oh, can I start? Sorry. Oh, yeah, please oh, do. Sorry. Good evening. I am the parent of a child who attended Talking in Class last school year presented by Just Communities. I'd like to make a complaint about this um, three-day course taught in the campus of Santa Barbara Junior High. I signed my child to participate in this three-day th three program because I was sold with the beautiful idea that Just Communities claim are doing of he helping to close the gaps among the students in the school. Being a moderate Democrat and believing in equal rights, I saw this program as a great opportunity for my child to be involved and to participate in the inclusion of all children. It was not. The first day of that course, of that course my child came home very angry and upset. When I contacted one of the teachers from Just Communities and told her the state of my child and asked her what was taught in the class. She responded to me by saying that my child said he was a disgrace to his family, that his reaction to the class was deeper than what was said in the classroom. She never told me what was taught that day in the class. Since my child has had medical problems since a baby, I believed her. And I even thanked Jess Communities for bringing this up. But as time went on, I realized that wasn't it. My child was upset because of things Jess Community teachers said during the course. I found that, that during the first day of class, some teachers from Jess Communities presented to the students two graphs. The first graph explained how Caucasian students have a high chance to graduate from college and how Latino and African Americans have a very low chance to making it in the, at the university level. Then I Another graph where they present the different social economic classes of people living in Santa Barbara, and they ask each student where do they belong in the graph. I am very concerned for all students, but especially for the message that you are giving, that if you are Latino or African American, you have a low chance of making it in society. When you are 12, 13, or 14 years old, and you hear from a just communities teacher at your school that you are disadvantaged because of your ethnicity, is that the message that you want to be giving these kids to encourage them to do good in school? Or is it to get them angry at society? These kids are at a very vulnerable age, and some of them can get very discouraged and affected psychologically from this message, making them not to even try to succeed. What every child needs instead is encouragement, support, and love, not what you are doing to them. Most children at the junior high are too young to be presented with this information. I also want to say how during springtime, my child got to text from Jazz Communities inviting him to go hiking to bring seconds. a friend. I never gave Jess just Communities, my child's number. Just Communities had my number, though, and they never contacted me to inform me of such an invitation. My child is a minor. minor. Is that even legal? Thank you for listening. Thank you. So our two final speakers are Deirdre Smith, followed by Doug Fisher. Good evening. I just wanted to start by saying that I was really heartened by uh, what President Sims Moten said about a positive example about an interaction with a student and a plan in a student being heard. Unfortunately, I'm here to speak about a time when my student was not heard. My name is Deirdre Smith and I'm a concerned um, parent to a child that goes to San Marcos High School. My daughter and her best friend were victims of a sex crime perpetrated by the same young man. My daughter reported the incident to her counselor at San Marcos with my encouragement and as reported to me by my daughter, was told that the school could not intervene because the incident did not take place on campus. I did not receive a phone call from that counselor informing me that my daughter had attempted to report that she was a victim of a crime, and had she gone confidentiality confidently without my knowledge, I never would have known. The counselor did forward the information to the school resource deputy, Deputy Casey Hunter, who thoroughly investigated the incident and who sought and received a felony arrest warrant for the perpetrator due to the serious nature of the crimes. The only contact I had regarding this situation was from the school resource deputy, never from the school. The school resource deputy notified me that the arrest warrant would be served on Friday, September 6th, and that the perpetrator would be arrested and transported to juvenile hall, and he would remain there until he was seen by the judge. Both myself and the parent of the other victim called San Marcos High School and left messages for the vice principal whom we were told was assigned to handle the situation. I wanted to know what kind of safety plan would be put into place when and if the perpetrator returned to school. I did not receive a call that day. Monday, September 9th, I left another message for the vice principal letting him know I wanted to discuss the situation, what safety plan was going to be put in place. I did not receive a phone call.
Tuesday, September 10th, I called and repeatedly asked to speak to a person and not be sent to voicemail. I then returned, received a call from probation telling me that the perpetrator was being placed on electronic monitoring and was ordered to return to school that day. I immediately left work and went to the school to take my daughter out of school as she was in three out of four classes with her perpetrator. While I was at the school, I demanded to speak to the principal. I was initially told I could only speak to the other vice principal. During that conversation, I learned that the school would not remove the perpetrator from the classes he shared with my daughter, even though the court gave my daughter a no contact order. The school stated that removing the perpetrator from shared classes would consider double punishment and that the perpetrator had rights. 30 seconds. At no point during that conversation did my daughter or I hear that my daughter had the right to be in classes free of being re-traumatized by seeing her perpetrator. I have a lot more to go over, but the bottom line was that the school did failed my daughter, failed to protect my daughter, and had the parent of the other student not voluntarily moved him to a different high school, she would still be forced to move out of her class as a punishment. These girls are paying attention to how they're being treated by reporting sex crimes and the way that they were treated was shameless. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our final speaker is Doug Fisher. Uh, I just wanted to respond to that, Ms. Smith. Certainly, I apologize. So sorry that your daughter experienced that. And so if you have the additional information that you weren't able to complete there, if you could give it to us so that we could maybe follow up with the conversation with you. Because, yeah, can you go? It's your turn. Uh, my name is Doug Fisher. Uh, I have a fifth grader uh, in the Santa Barbara Public Schools. I wanted to express my support for the excellent work done by Just Communities. Uh, I participated in a semester long program two and a half years ago with Just Communities at Monroe Elementary uh, called Parents for Inclusion, Diversity, and Access, a PETA program that one of our previous speakers spoke about. At, uh, at Adelante School. Uh, the PETA staff were very compassionate, highly skilled facilitators, bringing together a mix of English only, Spanish only, and bilingual uh, parents who all wanted to improve our school. And I was deeply moved by the experience and developed friendships that otherwise would never have happened uh, across the socioeconomic and racial divides that exist in our public schools. Some people have criticized Just Communities for being divisive and anti-establishment, and nothing could be farther from my experience. Uh, for 10 weeks of meetings, the PETA staff were models of bringing people together, ensuring that all voices present were heard, even the shy people. For 10 weeks, the, all of the parents there uh, present got to hear and discuss each other's very broad range of family and school experiences. With the help of Just Communities, we parents wrote 20 consensus recommendations to better engage children and families of all cultures and to strengthen the broader school community. We presented those recommendations to parents, to the principal, and some school board members, and everyone present expressed support both for the, the quality of the recommendations presented, some of which were impl implemented almost immediately, some of which were more expensive and are still being worked on, um, and, uh, and they also express support for the community-driven driven process that Just Communities facilitated. Uh, strengthening community at our schools is critically important work, and it must be continuous because we have annual turnover in the organization, all students moving on. All the research shows that stronger family engagement increases student achievement, and community building work of the sort provided by Just Communities is one of the best ways that the board can support stronger family engagement and therefore higher student achievement, particularly in historically underachieving groups of students um, in our schools. I have worked with a number of highly skilled professional facilitators in academia and in industry. The staff of Just Communities impressed me as being among the 30 seconds. best that I have worked with in any environment. They showed great skill in facilitating discussion despite language issues um, so that all participants' opinions were captured. They showed compassion and understanding of social issues. They were thoroughly familiar with our school and district issues to help provide information as well. I strongly endorse the work of Just Communities and I urge the board to renew or expand their contract with the school district. Thank you. Thank you, and actually I, I misspoke. There is one more that I missed, Cressida, Sil Cressida Silvis. Sorry about that. She'll be our final speaker, thank you. Thank you. Good evening. 
My name is Cressida Silvers. I'm a parent in the district with one child in junior high and two more in elementary school who will feed into the district in four years. I'm white and I come from a Christian family with more than one reverend among us, as does my husband. I'm here in support of Just Communities and of the board's ongoing commitment to the work they do in service of all of our children to promote human competency. I attended a Just Communities workshop for parents in May of 2018 on the topic of implicit bias. I found it to be a welcoming and non-judgmental event with diverse attendance. The research-based presentations on unconscious bias helped me better understand it as a part of human nature. Everyone has some bias of one sort or another, and biases can be created and fed by influences beyond our control. Most liberating, I thought, was the notion that unconscious bias is not something to feel guilty about or shamed for. And the facilitators made that very clear. I do not recall any particular group being singled out as the sole source or recipient of bias. Rather, discussion stemmed from participants and what we chose to bring up, thereby emphasizing how bias can work in all directions with any group. The critical part was that we all must be able to recognize our own biases and those uh, others may have against us if we want to work towards minimizing the damage they can cause to us as individuals, as families, communities, and as a society. I was so impressed by the way Just Communities facilitators created a comfortable forum for people of different backgrounds, experiences, and languages to come together in a way they may rarely, if ever, have opportunity to do otherwise, to share and explore genuine questions and concerns from all sides with facilitation that was thoughtful, generous, and positive. I've since attended another Just Communities workshop on increasing parental involvement at school, something we can all, especially in the PTA, appreciate. Uh, and a third meeting where parents who had participated in the PETA program at La Colina Junior High presented their recommendations for improvements at the school. Recom recommendations that to me seemed beneficial to all our kids. In my experience, and as the data shows, Just Communities does solid, effective work grounded in research and educational expertise with overwhelmingly positive impacts that improve student outcomes for those traditionally left behind, seconds. while also enriching the in educational and life experiences of students like my kids, who are already achieving at or above grade level. We are so fortunate to have an organization like this in our community, coupled with a school district that recognizes and values that work. It really makes me proud to be a parent here. Thank you. Thank you. And President Sims, and that, that concludes public comment. Thank you to all of our speakers for speaking out. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Capps. We will now move to uh, item D, acceptance of donations. I move to accept with gratitude the donations. Do I hear a second? A second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Uh, we're moving to our consent agenda. Uh, board members, are there any items from the consent agenda that you would like to um, pull for further discussion? Hearing none, can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? So moved. Ms. Hoare, second. I second. Ms. Minos, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. This moves us to our item F, the action agenda. The board action. Ms. Capps. It's not pulling up for me, but let's see. Okay. Get it? For some reason, the attachments are not loading. Okay. <laughs> Mine, hers either. I can just give the case numbers without the details. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so I um, move to accept the recommendation um, for expulsion in case number 201819-37. Second. I want to make sure that we have Is the time right? frame um, in terms of with the expansion. Okay. So we'll pull it up. So just a second. For a full, I can repeat that. Okay. So in the case of 201819-37, I uh, move to accept the recommendation for expulsion for one year. Okay. Do I hear a second? second Ms. Ford, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And what's the terms for the second? Okay. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Uh, in the case of 
2019-20-04. I move to accept the recommendation for full expulsion for one semester. So it's a stipulated agreement. Stipulated agreement. Okay. Do I hear a second? I second. Yes. All in favor? Aye. 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 I should pass this. Thank you, Ms. Thank you. Okay. So next on our F, next item is F3, approval of resolution 2019-20. S09 in support of recognition of October as National Dyslexia Awareness Month. We have two speakers. We have two speakers for this okay. resolution. Okay, uh, call back to the podium, uh, Moni DeWitt and Sherry Ray. Uh, first, Moni DeWitt for th three minutes. Hi there, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Yes, I'm, I'm really concerned about, as I have been here before, about the um, inaction of the board, and we need very specific interventions to make dyslexics uh, successful. And when I looked at the scores for Cleveland School, the numbers for the dyslexics who were able to meet the criteria for English was at 3%. You know, when I see these numbers, I find it heartbreaking and when I look at the established authorities, they say that early intervention is the key, as well as um, the Orton-Gillingham program. And um, we have to implement this by the third grade for students not to fall into the downward spiral, which leads to the school to prison pipeline. And as you're probably aware, the number of people who are illiterate in jail is actually up to 80% by many people's uh, data. So what I really want you to understand is by not taking action and just being aware but not actually taking concrete steps to assess everyone and get your child fine numbers up, you're actually um, in violating human rights because literacy is a human right, it's a very important right, and without it, these kids wind up in jail, you know? And it's really a road to nowhere. And I really want to impress upon the board that you need to take action. 20% are failing, and this is why. It's implicit bias is really, if you help this group, they are the Hispanic group and they're learning differences. If you support this group, your numbers will improve, and you'll actually be demonstrating that you don't have an implicit bias. Currently, by your inaction, it just really means to us that dyslexics and the Hispanics who are struggling as well with phonemic awareness, it really means that you don't care. That's what we're getting, and a lot of our needs are being postponed. You know, we listened to Luciano. He was here a year ago in tears. And th the sad part is, is his child didn't get the appropriate intervention. And then when he wanted to switch to private school, um, they didn't accept her. You know, so basically you're making a lot of people stuck. And the only way it really works is for people of means, like Charles Schwab. He made it through. Or but people without means, like in deep poverty, as we're well aware, Cleveland, Harding. 30 seconds. They're not going to make it. School to prison pipeline, and I really want you to think about that. Thank you. Thank you. Sherry Ray. Hi again. <laughs> I just want to provide a little bit of institutional memory about this proclamation. Several years ago, when I worked with district leaders on the first ever Dyslexia Awareness Month resolution, it was a time of great pride and accomplishment. I was tasked with, the, uh, with finding the wording, and I obtained this resolution that you have tonight from an advocate friend in Shasta County. At the time, the d document was both accurate and aspirational. It meant something, awareness and action. We had created the Innovative Parent Resource Center with its donated materials. Through it, we had great dyslexia outreach to students, educators, parents, and community members, including members of the media and elected officials. We were making a difference. After her visit, then-Representative Lois Capps was persuaded to join the Congressional Dyslexia Caucus. Salud Carbajal has followed her lead. Then assembly member Doss Williams stepped up to co-sponsor California's landmark dyslexia legislation in 2015. He has continued his support as a county supervisor, recognizing individuals in the community for their dyslexia work. 
We had daily interaction and improved communication with parents. We lessened lawsuits. We hosted well-attended monthly informational meetings called Dyslexia Dialogues in this boardroom. We established the prestigious annual Dysle Distinguished Dyslexic Series and hosted several nationally known dyslexic speakers, including Pulitzer Prize nominee novelist Victor Villasenor. We developed collaborative relationships throughout the community and we made a difference. We had a long way to go, as you heard from um, many parents, but all of those, all of that outreach, all of that is gone now. Dyslexic students need a great deal that we do not provide. And um, I'm asking you tonight to please not to pass this resolution because it's not true. Um, when it says that we use the, mo the, dis the district uses the most current research-based practices, it's not true. I ask you don't pass it because awareness without appropriate action is simply a meaningless feel-good gesture. And the one in five students who have dyslexia, approximately 3,000 students in this district, deserve better. What I'd like to ask you instead is let's convene a roundtable of community experts to address this pressing issue, much as Superintendent Blaise Garza did when he created a task force in 1990. Those findings of his dyslexia task force were never implemented, however. We can and must do better with a comprehensive approach to dyslexia that becomes a regular part of the educational services of this school district and cannot be changed at the direction of the next administrator. Do this so that next year, in good conscience, an original and meaningful resolution for Dyslexia Awareness Month can be written to reflect responsible action and an improved and honest reality. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes public comment for this agenda item. Okay, so we have Dr. Wagnett. Good evening, board. Um, Mr. Matsuoka, Ms. Sims Moten, Ms. Caps, Ms. Munoz, Ms. Ford. Usually we just say the board. I'll call you all <laughs> by name. Um, I had prepared comments to go along with this resolution and um, I have edited them uh, as I've been listening tonight. I think you should pass this resolution. I sit here and my colleagues, administrators from sites are here and I know how hard they work for all of our students because in our district we know that our children are our most valuable resource. And there are some people who don't believe that we think that. But I honor my colleagues right now because they work hard to make sure that children can read, write, think critically every day. Now there are some disagreements about how we go about doing that. And so, you know, often when we do resolutions, we put the resolution up there and um, it's a way to acknowledge um, something that's important to us. Dyslexia is a, important to us. Do we do it perfectly? No, absolutely not. And I'm sorry, um, I will ap apologize on behalf of the special ed department uh, to the parent who spoke out earlier, both of the parents who spoke out earlier, we need to do better. But in this district, we believe in equity, um, we evaluate our work and we improve our practices. This is not a ship that will be turned instantaneously. And so what I am proposing is that rather than just uh, adopting this resolution, that we, I agree with Ms. Ray. We need to sit down and talk about dyslexia. And so I would like to offer that we um, set a date in October to hold that and uh, begin talking sharing what we're doing, sharing the wonderful things that are going on at our schools. And, uh, you know, it's not about our words. It's not about the words on the paper. It's about the actions that we're taking. So um, I ask that the board adopt this resolution declaring October as Dyslexia Awareness Month in the Santa Barbara Unified School District. Board, any comments? Ms. Capps? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Wagner. I, I appreciate that you embrace the suggestion to talk. Um, I do, I, of course, support this this resolution as an um, expression of 
the priority that our district places on this. I think that there's the things with the community and those advocates who believe so passionately. We hear from you so often during board meetings, but if you could re-engage, I would be so grateful because I wish that we were working together instead of this opposition that we, we've been hearing, at least here at the board meetings, to understand better how this pilot project can be worked with those who, again, have been leading this charge for so long, for decades in this community. So I would support it with that understanding of this dialogue somehow getting back on track mm -hmm. that it seemed to be uh, a few years ago, but it has gotten off track. And I just want to acknowledge um, that we've heard you, but again, we're not in the classroom, and I want to leave it to those who are to make sure that your expertise and your thoughts can be incorporated more successfully. So thank you, Dr. Wagner, for taking that suggestion from Ms. Ray, and I look forward to hearing about how that, what the results are, and if there's a, a way in which the board can participate, I certainly would be interested. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Capps. We're, we're always better together. Ms. Ford. Thank you. I echo what Ms. Capps has said, and thank you to not only what you're saying, Dr. Wagonet, but our, our uh, critics, because I think it can only make us better. But mm -hmm. it is not a mystery. Dys dyslexia is not a mystery. I do think that it would be, I'm really hopeful that the rest of my colleagues are as interested as I am in understanding if we are using best practices, if we are doing our best to identify and address dyslexia early, that's, uh, that's a key to the success. And also, I am alarmed, and it's right here, that this is probably up to 3,000 students mm -hmm. in this district, so uh, I appreciate the resolution, but nothing is powerful without us actually having the action and appreciate that we will do something about this and that the board will be as informed as everyone else. Thanks. Thank you, and, and we will be bringing, um, as previously planned, a, a report on special education, um, and we certainly will be including dyslexia in that as a part of that uh, presentation or report on October 8th, so that's that will also be part of what's going on. Okay, Mr. Matsuyla. Uh Let me clarify for the board, so this, the special ed report is coming to you October 8th, and then the results of a research study year long about last year's efforts will be presented on October 22nd about the dyslexia efforts for last year and uh, to maybe help our, our newer board members. So this program started at one school, last year went to five schools, this year we are at eight schools. So just, and we'll include the history of this project uh, as part of that October 22nd report. Ms. Munoz. Certainly, I also appreciate, you know, the day-to-day -day work of the staff and the schools in terms of supporting our students with dyslexia and realize that it's very, you know, very common that so many of our students have that in addition to other, you know, um, challenges that they face. And I'm certainly, you know, grateful for your words um, and approach that in terms of having a dialogue with the community mm -hmm. and look forward to learning more about it also. It has my full support. <laughs> Yeah, I too support the, this resolution, but I also want to, as you re-engage with the community, want to make sure that First Five is at the table as well for early identification to the, to the level mm -hmm. that it can be. I mean, I may not get to the reading, but I think if there's things that we can start to look at and impact it as well at an early part, so want to engage at that time as well. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. So hearing that, thank you, board. Um, can I get a motion to approve the resolution 2019-2009 in support of recognition of October as National Dyslexia Awareness Month? I so move. Second. Yep. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passed. Thank you, Dr. Wagner. Okay. All right. We've come to that time uh, in our agenda. I want to. Um, respect in terms of board members, whether we usually take a break at this point is we can take a quick five minute break because we're going to have a pretty lengthy. Okay, so we'll take a quick five minute break. Okay, seven minutes just to make sure. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Okay, so I'm going to call us back to order.
All right, so we're gonna get continue on. I appreciate this dialogue that's going on, um, but we're gonna bring us back to order. Um, so are those, oh, those just ones you have, okay. All right, so we're gonna move to our report and discussion agenda, thank you. Um, so the annual academic performance report, also known as the CAPS Resort for English, Language, Arts, Literacy, and Mathematics, 2015-2019. Ms. Carey and Dr. Ramirez. Uh, Ms. President, oh, are there president? President, we have okay. three we have uh, public comment requests. Okay, thank you on this agenda item. So first we have uh, Jill Rivera. So just to repeat, we'll have three minutes per person, followed by Ellen Warren, followed by James Fechner. Oh, it's nice to get the cool breeze outside. <laughs> Good evening. Um, I was reviewing the budget. I have to stand on my tippy toes here. I was reviewing the budget for 2019 and 2000, or 2020, and from what I see, it's $176 million. And we currently have approximately 13,000 students enrolled. And uh, as we'll take a look at this in a minute, um, the return on our investment is pretty bad. Um, according to this, this report, 46% of our students are performing uh, not to the standard in English language arts. And 55% uh, are not performing in math. And uh, it's not clearly a money problem. I think it's an allocation problem. Uh, I've been informed by a lot of my friends who are teachers in the district that there currently isn't any adopted reading or math curriculum for K through five, K through fifth grade. And that includes phon uh, phonetics, no phonetics for our kids. Now, studies show that if the achievement gap is not close by grade three. What that means is if, if a child is not reading at grade level by grade three, they will never catch up, okay? So to our friend's point here earlier, this is an equity problem. And I can tell you because I volunteered as a literacy uh, advocate at Juvenile Hall, when we have Juvenile Hall here in our city. And I, was, uh, I actually donated 3,000 books to our Juvenile Hall system. And I was also a volunteer and helped the inmates learn how to read. And I can tell you that every single kid in there was not literate, okay? So the pipeline to prison um, narrative is a, true, is a true one. So if you really care about equity and closing the achievement gap, I urge you to focus your resources on early elementary literacy and reading intervention and math and I think that some of these programs for social equity would be better spent on early intervention instead of social programming. Many parents, including myself, I had three kids in the district. I had to spend my own resources to provide tutoring outside of school. I had two special needs kids and I spent a ton of cash helping them because I didn't get what I needed in the schools. Um, I'm also in the corporate world. And three, in the corporate seconds. world, if a CEO doesn't deliver results to their shareholders of a publicly traded company, they're out of a job. As taxpayers, we demand better return for our investment. Thank you. Thank you. Ellen Warren, followed by James Fechner, followed by Sharon, Sheridan Rosenberg. <coughs> Hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, correct something that I said at the last board meeting. It was a date that I misspoke and gave a wrong date. And I just want to correct it for the record. The Articles of Incorporation that Jack Revis and Fran Wagonek signed in their respective roles as assigned directors of the Just Community Central Coast were dated on December 30th, 2008, not 2018, as I erroneously stated in my last statement to the board. So thank you very much. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. James Fechner. Uh, thank, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak again, and thanks for thanks for listening. Um, will I be able to to, to cite slides in in my, in my comments for this? Is it technically possible? If, if sure, I mean if. Um, okay, I just would know if they would actually come up. <laughs> Abracadabra, slide six. Um, but that's what I would like to go to here. Um, the um, so I looked over this data, and it was um, extremely troubling. Um, 
this report is 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 a disgrace to our town um, it's false and misleading um, if you look at these numbers right here 54 percent of students are not at grade level okay there's a there's there's around three thirteen thousand one hundred and fifty six students who are included in that number so you figure out the, the the percentage that is not if we do the math right we can do the math 46 46 percent are not at grade level if you multiply that that's over six thousand students we just talked about dyslexia being a big number this is a huge number it's a huge number it's a huge issue of equity that's exactly what that is if you um go further and look at within the numbers which the district was highlighting as positive is absolutely it's absolutely abominable it is on um it is on slide eight please thank you um there's a couple things i just want to point out here grade five 35 percent of the uh, student body in grade five are not are, are exceeding um, are meeting the standards that means what percentage is not 65 percent it's huge if you're at this age and you're having troubles it becomes worse and worse and worse we have to address that look at the numbers here two percent up for this year but we're still at 45 percent which means as a random coin toss you meet a kid in this district odds are they're not at proficiency for math those are the odds it's a coin toss um, now, the last point I wanted to make was this um, covering of this in some type of um, improvements in, in the, the way that the, the district is spending its money. And on 15, please, if you don't mind looking at that. And you have 30 seconds. Oh, I'm going to be quick. Um, the disparity within the schools is huge. That, that um, 2 percent is largely due to Goleta Valley. Rather than to pat our heads, uh, uh, ourselves on the head about spending money for just communities, Please look at where the winners are and, and, and see if it, was, if it was a social justice issue, they would all be affected somewhat, somewhat equally and they're not. What matters here are parents' involvement, great teachers, and really engaged principals. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peckner. Now we have our last speaker for this agenda item is Sheridan Rosenberg. Thank you. I agree. This report is very damning, and I think it also um, really speaks to a larger problem about priorities. So we received $193 million and some change in 2016, and yet we still hear excuses that the restrooms are still in the condition that they're in, and yet you have a $40 million stadium that's already done. That's about priorities. I promise you, in the Hope District or in Montecito Union, those parents wouldn't have put up with it. They would have been here at these board meetings saying, are you kidding me? You need to hand over that money. You need to fix this now. It's a safety issue. It's a health issue. No more hand wringing. No more pearl clutching. You can't, these numbers don't lie. You have kids who cannot read and do math. This is what bigotry looks like. This is what bigotry looks like when you create an LCAP document that is centered around a false narrative of cultural proficiency. How on earth do you measure that? This is quantifiable. This, the, the priority of LCAP that I've seen in any other school district, it's about early childhood intervention for literacy, which is a human right. I'm the mother of an IEP kid. I was very blessed that he got to go through Laguna. It's why he's successful today, because he got the support he needed. There is no excuse why we cannot do that in this school district. But the first thing we need to do is abandon what isn't working. Bucketing money to your buddies in these nonprofits, AHA, Just Communities, Calm, it's shameful that they have the nerve to get up to the microphone and ask for money out of a school district filled with kids who can't read, who are living below the poverty line. Are you kidding me? You guys are in big trouble. I think you need to start taking some scalps. This is failure. If this was a private corporation, people would be fired. Fire them. Start over. Dig into that LCAP. Overhaul it. That's a waste of money. The perfect use for that money, as an example, rather than aha, would have been 
the kids that couldn't go to sleepaway camp, having, it, for example, you know, uh, teachers accompany them. So everyone can go. That's what equity looks like. Everybody is treated the same. And you're not doing that. But you are providing a lot of coddling to these nonprofits, and it's just wrong. And everyone's starting to wake seconds. up to it. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes public comment for this agenda item. Thanks to the speakers. Ms. Kerry and Dr. Ramirez, thank you. Good evening, board. Uh, <clears throat> uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, here to discuss this topic with you. Um, just a, I've prepared a, just a few opening comments. Uh, Ms. Kerry will do the same. Um, so if you'll just indulge me for a moment. Uh, the report tonight provides a broad look at the performance of our students in grades 3 through 8 and 11 uh, based on California assessment and, and accountability system, which is an important measure of academic performance in English language arts literacy and math or mathematics. Uh, although important, it is one of multiple measures the state has created in order to assess the status of our schools and district. Uh, those include um, additional metrics for performance, uh, such as college career readiness, A through G course completion, as well as other measures for school climate and academic engagement. So what you'll see tonight is one of uh, several uh, academic measures that uh, provide us a more um, robust look at, uh, at our schools. Um, as we engage in this discussion, I would like to also highlight that California's new accountability system does by design accentuate and stress the importance of growth, um, thereby acknowledging that not all students have the same starting point. Um, and finally, I want to acknowledge uh, the effort of Dr. Guillermo Chelsea Juan in our ETS uh, department in providing this preliminary information ahead of public release. Um, it's not an easy task and one that uh, we will speak to in greater depth during, the con th during our presentation. Um, final point, I also want to acknowledge, you know, as a, as a show of just how important uh, this is, the presence of our um, school principals uh, here to engage in this public discourse as the uh, representatives from their school learning communities. Okay, we'll go ahead and begin. Sorry, since my back is to the presentation, I'll read from here. So uh, we, we uh, broke this uh, presentation into three parts. Um, you see a narrative that supports, you know, uh, with greater um, information and greater context. Uh, the first part is where we have been. A um, couple of points to make. Uh, there have been, as you heard um, at our last board meeting, uh, there have been major changes to our preschool through 12 education in the last 30 years. Um, the ex state expectations for academic rigor have increased dramatically. Uh, you and the public got uh, a broad orientation of what, of, of what that entails. Um, the assessment that we have now technologically and cognitively is much more rigorous than it ever has been. And the equity in student outcomes uh, continues to be um, a challenge. Um, funding and accountability, uh, as was mentioned by, by some, of our, um, some of our public comments, uh, has shifted. It's shifted from the state level on through and stressing more and more local accountability, local responsibility, and local action, and local prioritization. Um, for us, as a, as a district, uh, equity is at the heart of it. Now, what I will say about equity is that I think sometimes that term is, is uh, used a bit loosely. Uh, when we talk about equity, um, we oftentimes confuse that with equality. If all students receive the same, the outcome for students that don't have the same starting point um, necessarily means that they will, uh, by virtue of that, uh, that way of applying resources and attention, uh, create, uh, just continue to exacerbate or continue to maintain a very real gap in, uh, in attainment. And I would also offer up that what you see here is a symptom, a symptom of much deeper rooted cultural and societal uh, concerns. And since we're talking about these within our district, they are also expressed in our community. Uh, the, the public commentary that was offered up during the night uh, speaks to some of that. Um, as we look at uh, state and local, uh, there is incremental growth overall in the assessment results over the last five years for our district. Um, let me be clear, 
none of us are satisfied with the outcomes. None of us are satisfied with the results. We look at this and um, all of us as leaders, uh, as staff, um, have to find a way to grapple with how, to, how this applies to us in a very personal and professional level. Um, but one of the things that I have seen elevate itself, and I think I, I speak for all of our administrators, leaders, and staff who are in the room, is that our sense of urgency and awareness over the exact issues that we need to address um, are becoming clearer and clearer. But the ability to be able to rally around those and turn them into actionable results is something that, um, that some of our schools are, are really becoming trendsetters, and some of that data bears that out. So I just wanted to provide this as an opening frame uh, before turning it over to Ms. Carey. Thanks, Dr. Ramirez. Uh, good morning. Um, good morning. <laughs> good, good evening, board. Um, we're not even close to morning, unlike some other board meetings. Um, so I just wanted to, to walk us through uh, the part of the narrative and the slide that, that, that deck that talks about where we are now. Um, and we, I really do recommend that people read the narrative that accompanies this because it does a better job than some of the terms that are on this particular slide um, of explaining what some of these things look like in practice at our school sites. Um, but in a nutshell, what we have been embarking on for several years now and really at the site level um, for about three years is uh, deep work in learning to see the system that produces the results we're getting. Um, with an, a, a reference to, to what Dr. Ramirez just said uh, about the way the education system is designed and the results that it produces. And so how we can sort of best understand um, what very specifically contributes to those, those outcomes and patterns, how we can dismantle and disrupt those parts of the design, and then exercise our professionalism to redesign uh, learning through, for students through cycles of inquiry. Um, We've experienced in our district, in addition to the changes and shifts that have happened um, in our state and in the nation, we've had our own cultural shifts as a district um, in our leadership team, in our coherence making, in developing our collective efficacy, which we talked about a little bit at the last board meeting as the phenomenon in which uh, adults and students alike feel agency around being able to effect change in outcomes um, and, and the extent to which that happens collaboratively. And we've talked a lot about our team structures. Um, we're going to go to in just a moment to a diagram that will illustrate some of these terms you see in the fourth the fourth bullet. That the key drivers that we've been focusing on are are establishing and staying true to instructional focus, uh, established instructional focus areas, both as a district and as uh, individual school sites. Um, deepening the collaborative culture and, and practices that help to support and sustain those collaborative cultures. Um, deepening learning, we explored that at the last board meeting in terms of unpacking what depth of knowledge as a, as a construct means and has there, how there has been that shift in rigor. Um, precision, precision of pedagogy, the specific instructional strategies that have been proven to be high yield. Um, and accountability via the cycles of collaborative inquiry. And that's a, a, a simple but iterative cycle that involves designing, implementing, analyzing, um, and refining instructional, instructional practice. Um, as we shift to the diagram that I was just referencing, we've, we've presented this many times, but we, it's a very powerful one. It's one that really is, does anchor our work as leadership teams, as leaders at school sites, and increasingly as teacher leaders who serve on SLT teams and as PLC leads uh, for teacher teams. Another way to see this diagram um, is as a huddle with student learning in the middle and those other boxes uh, circled up around, huddled around student learning, um, which is less hierarchical, um, but also there's, there's uh, authenticity to saying that when there are decisions made at either end of this or, or actions or responses that occur at either end of this diagonal continuum, um, it's something that we need to understand across the whole system and respond to in ways that are appropriate to our respective roles. Um, this diagram emphasizes the importance of the concept of leading from the middle and we have most deeply invested in um, establishing and nurturing our school leadership teams. And so we have lots of contractual agreements around how those teams function. Um, and we have uh, increasingly built capacity with our principals as leaders 
and other district office leaders, um, and increasingly extended to our SLT teams uh, both the opportunity and the tools for in turn leading the rest of their colleagues and, and their t and their, who are on their PLCs and in their teacher teams. Um, I would invite you to see that diagonal red line as the strategic focus for the district, which is that students will read, reason, and communicate in order to contribute positively to an ever-changing and increasingly multilingual world. So we see that instructional focus, which is specific enough to be, to be actionable and to mean something really impactful, but also universal enough to hold all of our individual school sites identified areas of instructional focus. That's really the connective tissue in this, in this work of collaborative culture. Um, so I would like to say that um, echoing what Dr. Ramirez said, uh, while we are not satisfied with what the data, data, the picture that the data paints as a whole, um, I would say that we are increasingly encouraged by the process that we're engaged in and the kind of trends that we are starting to see emerge, um, particularly as we study um, places where there where there's clearly is acceleration or even in the aggregate upward trends overall, as incremental as those may be. So I would just also uh, want to say at the outset here that, that um, we talk about sometimes the speed of, of change and I always like to link it to the speed of trust. You've heard me say that before. Uh, it's a concept that, that Stephen Covey has put forward. Um, and in this case, it's not so much in our personal trust as might originally be connoted, but it's really about trusting ourselves as professionals who can identify problems of practice, who can together, through our collective, increasing collective e efficacy, identify ways to address problems that concern us, and having increasing trust in the systems that will best support improved student outcomes. Um, so as that trust grows in these sy sy uh, systemic endeavors, that's where we're seeing the, the incremental improvements in, in student achievement. So in terms of the results for where we are, um, just a reminder that we test students that CASP is administered to students in grades 3 through 8 and also in grade 11 and only in grade 11 at the high school level. Um, that's the number of students that were assessed in spring 2019. And that overall, again, we are not seeing the gains we'd like to see yet, but we are glad to see that we are maintaining uh, progress that's been made in previous years. It's not explicitly stated here, but I need to underscore the fact that if you're maintaining progress, if you're continuing to be consistent with levels of students, percentages and proportions of students who are meeting or exceeding the standard, then effectively that is growth because the targets shift every year year over year, the bar gets raised. Um, we see a slight dip in ELA literacy overall, a slight increase in math, but all of which, all of that, whether for good or for bad, is, is not within the realm of what we consider statistically significant, which is about a three percentage point range. So really, it's a maintain kind of report. That's a, that's a high level takeaway. Um, some of the things that I'd like to highlight is that we have some examples of notable student group progress. We are very heartened to see that students with disabilities, um, who we remain very focused on and who are, we're having very focused conversations ar around, um, actually made considerable gains. Uh, we were tasked with ensuring that students with disabilities um, improved by at least three points towards standard, or what we call the, you know, level three deal, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about distance from standard. Um, and we have uh, not only met, but exceeded that growth target substantially, both in ELA and in math for students with disabilities. Um, we see gains in math for Latinx and English learners. Um, and you'll be able to see better in the bar graphs later about the progress of our reclassified students um, and how in several cases, uh, students who are reclassified as fluent English proficient outperform English only students. Um, as we look at these graphs, you're gonna see them slice several ways. Uh, this is our internal report. As was mentioned earlier, this data is not yet publicly released, so this is our internal um, reporting on the data and analysis and presentation of the data. And as such, we've had to make a lot of decisions about what to bring forward and in what view. Because if you go onto the CAS website, which you should be able to do soon, we hope, um, or even look at past year's results, the, it's very, very dense. So what I want to orient you to is that tonight we, we'll, we've chosen to share with you um, oh, the overall percentages of students 
meeting and exceeding standard, as well as the uh, student performance data associated with distance from standard. And I'll review that briefly, because I know we learned about that last time. Uh, we're going to see that both for English language arts and for math. And we're going to see that sliced um, with a view that shows us district-wide performance by grade level, district-wide performance by student group, and performance um, according to specific school sites, so school, school uh, site-specific performance. So this first graph here is showing us uh, the overall, so district-wide uh, along the grade levels, and then in the, in the far right column there, uh, the, the data for all grades showing us the percentage of students who meet and exceed standards um, for English language arts. And as you'll note there, we had that slight decrease. You see the 54% rate. Um, that is, is still a percentage rate that's five points over the state performance level from spring 2018. So just to put some of these results in context, I know, I know it can be concerning. It is to us that we have so many students who are not yet meeting standard. Um, but as we also learned in the September 10th board meeting, the shift from STAR and the former uh, standards and assessment model to CASP, um, we know that the, the, the rigor, that there's a significant, I mean, it cannot really be overstated, the uptick in rigor and in complexity uh, of instruction that's being demanded by the Common Core Standards, like by the California Standards. Um, just to review, because I think it is worthy of reviewing, in, under the STAR assessment, um, less than 2% of, of mathematics items on that assessment were at DOK levels 3 and 4. And about 22% of ELA test items were at DOK levels three and four. By contrast, with CASP, more than two-thirds of the items, both on ELA and math, are ranked as being at DOK levels three and four. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a paradigm shift. It's not just an incremental shift. It's an entire paradigm shift. So we also read this as, 54% of students are demonstrating that they can meet or exceed standards knowing that that standard is toggled to a DOK 3 and 4 level. So I would just again recommend to folks if they have not seen it, the September 10th board meeting attachments where we talk a lot more about what DOK means and there's even sample items um, and there's lots more of those resources also um, available through the CDE website. I will also use this slide to say that um, this shows us our meets and exceeds. What it's not showing us, what we're not seeing in this report are the proportion of students who nearly meet standard or do not meet standard. And so we also track shifts in those numbers. And we look at moving students incrementally up from one performance band to another. So we can't do all of that in one, that's, that's a lot, that's too much to do all in one board report, but I just wanna highlight what you are seeing and what we're not seeing with the report that we're bringing forward tonight. Um, this is the first slide that we see that, that talks about distance from three. So as a, as a, a reminder about this, um, the engineering behind dis distance from, from, from standard, it used to be dis distance from three, now it's distance from standard. Again, with standard being toggled to DOK, depth of knowledge level three. Um, you can even see there on the right there, we have that prediction that dashboard prediction that the dashboard release will trail the public release of CASP test results. And we do predict being in, in yellow for English language arts because of, of, of overall m maintaining student performance. Um, Dr. Mears talked earlier about the really talented team we have in, in our ETS department and with Dr. Guillermo Juan. Um, I think it is worth mentioning without unpacking too much that um, sometimes you might see differences, discrepancies between numbers, specific uh, statistics reported here, and those, the way that those statistics might be rep reported in the CDE, in the California Department of Education website. Um, actually, internal to the California Department of Education website, there are even discrepancies between how the raw test results are reported and how the re results are reported on the dashboard. And that's because the dashboard goes another measure further at trying to more meaningfully capture student experiences and trends um, in labels such as students with disabilities or reclassified fluent English proficient students than the strict definition of those student groups um, allows for. So, you know, we have to make choices about which numbers to use, and I want you to feel confident that these numbers are 
are reviewed and revised and are calibrated not only with the CDE uh, reports, but also um, with our own reports year over year. So we can, you know, of course, explore that further with anybody who's interested. But I, I think that's worth noting because you may see slight differences, and I wanted to under, uh, ex explain why. So um, distance from standard is derived by students on the CASP and ELA and math, they earn a scaled score. It's a four-digit score. Um, it doesn't mean much to most, most folks without really diving into how that score comes about. What is important is that certain threshold scores determine whether you are deemed standard not met, standard nearly met, standard met, or standard exceeded. And so those, those floor scores, we might call them the, the scores that are at the floor, those are those threshold scores where you either have or have not met standard. Um, when we look at distance from, three, for distance from standard data, what we're looking at is the average of all scores. And in this case, it's all district scores for ELA. And how far that average scale score is from that threshold score that is standard. And so we're able to see um, that in grades three through eight, three through eight and 11, uh, over the last five years, um, and we're projecting still preliminarily for 2019, we see an upward trend and we see it uh, in, in those increments that you see there. You heard my reference earlier about the significance of even a three point increase in uh, distance from standard, if you're approaching standard or, or, or exceeding standard, um, being sufficient in the case of, of our own district with students with disabilities to, um, to qualify us to exit differentiated assistance. So it's not small to have a three percentage point uh, or three point rather increase in distance from standard. I'm going to turn over to Dr. Ramirez. As Ms. Gary was mentioning for uh, ELA literacy, um, here are the overall results, uh, preliminary results for, uh, for math um, in grades uh, three through, I'll speak to the three through six. Uh, one of the, the challenges that we, that we face when we look at grade three is that really that's uh, a very, that's a reflection I think of, of uh, really preschool through uh, grade three. Um, and what we find is that year over year, each cohort is remaining stable to, to there being some, some increase in growth. The challenge that we're faced with is that there's a regression in grades four and five uh, before, before uh, finding another um, improvement in grade six. Uh, the, the, the improvement uh, in grade six this past year was projected to be at 5%, which is, which is something uh, healthy for us in terms of growth. Um, in grades seven through seven and eight and eleven, uh, we see some of the same phenomena where cohort over cohort is is performing uh, relatively uh, stable. So those those scores are are stagnant. I think we can also derive some meaning from uh, this, which is uh, another paradigm shift, as as Ms. Uh, Carey mentioned, which is the distance from standard. The, here's where we're starting to see improvement. Now, what the prior slide won't show is students that grew um, and the does not meet or nearly meets from one year to the other. What this particular um, graphic would, would indicate is that there is growth happening, but of course it's not manifesting yet in students meeting and exceeding standard and, re and reaching that, that threshold um, year over year. And we see the, the, trends li the trend lines pretty um, uh, pretty squarely. This is our so this is our first look at the CASP data for English language arts by student group. Um, so on the ones that were, were sliced by grade level, you saw the grade levels three through 11 lined up that way. Here we have student groups um, lined up by um, basically average performance uh, from, from lowest to highest. So y there might be a question about how is, why is this graph organized in this way? Um, and and that's, that's why. Um, so I've, I've talked a little bit about students with disabilities who we see on the far left, but also about that really important um, attainment of, of uh, being in a place that is other than red on the dashboard. Um, and red has to do with a combination, either low performance or a decline in performance or both. And so we're, we're really um, 
looking forward to seeing how our dashboard reports the progress we've made there. It's a little hard to perceive from this graph because of the size of the numbers and the scaling of the graph, um, but we know that we there were significant gains there. Um, I would think what I would I want to highlight here just to, uh, t you know, refer back to one of the things that we said as notable is the performance of reclassified fluent English proficient students, um, you know, f far to the relative right on this graph. Um, so that's a, that's a real credit to our staff um, and to uh, our leaders who support the English learner space. Um, but clearly there's, there's work to be done. Um, we want to see these bar graphs being above that line and, and not below them. And we want to see more, proportion, more and better proportionality across student groups than we currently see. Um, I think what I would invite people to do is to sort of look at this, pat, you know, look at this in, a, in a way that looks for the pattern and um, acknowledging how the graph is arranged and, and such. Um, we still see in, in virtually every student group an, an upward trend, an incremental but upward trend. This is the same view for math, district-wide by student group. And really the comments are the same. So as we now turn our attention to um, the distance from standard by school, uh, this is where we see um, some very interesting trends um, begin to appear. Um, this uh, org organizationally is also, as Ms. Carey and as, as most of these charts are, in, um, in order of performance relative to standard. And if you look at the standard, that it would be that uh, that zero, that, 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 uh, that line that demarcates uh, about midway through. Um, we have, one of the things that we have um, noticed and looked at, and it's part of what we need to acknowledge, is that the growth among some schools has been very remarkable, especially when you look at it cohort over cohort. Uh, I'll point to the, the, the improvement at, uh, at Adams over uh, the last five years and the ability to maintain uh, year over year. I'll point to Franklin's growth uh, where, when CASP debuted at being a, an aggregate of negative uh, 56, now being a positive five. Um, Roosevelt's um, has, has fluctuated um, back and forth from standard. Uh, Harding, however, you look at uh, a negative 74 versus a minus 23, a very precipitous uh, forward movement. And SBCA, Monroe, um, in, 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 their own, in their own way. Um, when we talk about the performance of McKinley and Cleveland, um, certainly those are the, the schools that we are uh, paying closest attention to. Um, as, we, as we are that program, that school community, we've invested a lot of our time um, trying to understand the, the, the matters that are happening uh, there and how to uh, prioritize our resources, prioritize our attention. But also, in oftentimes the question that I get asked the most is, what is happening at those schools um, that are that are indicating that upward trend, that are that are that are gaining at uh, at much greater levels? I, I wish I could offer a simple response. I've tried to offer that um, here and elsewhere, and in in other settings except to say that it's uh, many of the principles that those of us who've uh, come up as educators and had the opportunity to understand see in real time and over time, which is excellent leadership, a stable staff that is all focused and committed to some of the same values and principles, instructional practices that go where you can see on a given day um, as you go from one classroom to the other, up and down grade levels, that is consistent, where students' routines are consistent, high levels of parent engagement, where parents feel welcome, they are seen, they are welcomed, and other amenities are provided to them to try to diminish the barriers that exist for many. But more than anything else, you see focus over time. And a constant retooling and questioning of practices, never resting on laurels, 
But the other part that most people wouldn't see is taking a critical look at things that may be operating as barriers, even if they're very well-meaning and well-intentioned, um, how we use time, how we organize ourselves, what kind of organization we provide, how we, uh, how we intervene without impacting core instruction, which is an incredibly difficult thing to do. Um, and I would just say that those programs are more mature in that element, in that aspect. But I would also say that we are doing everything we can to very strategically uh, ensure that those practices and those mindsets are also permeating to other schools. And they are. Um, and so I think that this is, um, as I mentioned from the outset, it's not the, the, the kind of data and results that we want to see. But we also have to look at and be very careful about the cultural markers that need to be prioritized before the results can come. And um, I feel confident in saying that those are in place or are becoming very much ingrained into the day-to-day -day, um, comings and goings of the school and the school staff. And, uh, but they're very difficult to quantify. And uh, because we're at the end of the day, we're talking about some things that are, that are felt and not always visible. So we're doing our best to quantify those, to capture them in agreements, and to rally around those practices um, where leaders are sharing those with one another, where staff has an opportunity to see firsthand that there's no magic to this, but it is an incredible amount of hard work. And, um, and our staff, to their credit, our teaching staff in particular, has been incredible in trying to embrace many of these shifts, difficult as they, be, as they have been. And what I've heard most recently is that what keeps them motivated is the kind of outcomes and, and output that students are producing on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's what, what gives them confidence that they are continuing to focus on the right levers to bring about the much desired change that we all want to see, which is a shift in these numbers. Uh, prior to transitioning to the junior high so that we can just be more fluid with this, I'd, I'd like to point out that some of those same gains that, are, uh, that we see in literacy are also crossing over to math, and you see some of the same trends. I'll point to Franklin, negative 67 at the outset of CASP, now minus 5. They are, and other schools and classrooms are reframing the idea that our kids in poverty can achieve if, if, if the right conditions and levers are focused on over a sustained period of time. Um, I will point to Harding's growth um, in math and, and many others that, that, that right now is more incremental, but uh, where the growth is, is starting to really take shape I don't know who's at the bowl tonight. <laughs> um, so as we switch to secondary school, there's, there's just some things that I think I have to point out because they're really visually obvious when you look at the data presented in this way. Um, and that is that um, while we can see some trends that seem pretty clear for specific sites, um, it's very difficult to discern an overall trend for student performance in ELA and for math when it comes to the secondary schools. I'll toggle back and forth between ELA and math as I, as I speak to, these, uh, to this data. Um, when it comes to what's happening at specific school sites, um, there's lots of variables and reasons that go into how any given cohort of students performs. Um, and it's not always easy to discern exactly what is accounting for uh, those results. Um, I would argue that sometimes in the secondary space, because of the scope and complexity of the secondary space, it can be even harder to do, say particularly at a high school, and particularly with one test administration at the junior year, 11th grade. So we, there's a lot of things to unpack here. Um, I have the opportunity to sit and talk with principals and do sense making about the data and what the data tells us. Um, and, and those are rich conversations that I'm, I know the principals welcome and encourage and uh, stimulate and respond are responsive to those conversations happening within their own uh, spheres of influence. Um, but one of the things that, that I would like to make sure that it is very clear is 
uh, particularly on the heels of the September 10th report, um, just because there may be there may be challenges associated with, you know, particularly in the junior year of high school, test administration, uh, students sort of say buy-in, things like that, it doesn't make these test results less valuable or less meaningful to us because the kinds of things we know CASP is testing for are the exact kind of things we know students will need to be able to contribute positively to the ever-changing world that we're sending them into. So when our school sites are focusing on evidence-based reasoning and cr high levels of critical thinking and effective communication, and we know that the test is testing for those things, and we see these um, this, this lack of discernible progress toward being able to show that students can better and better demonstrate that over time, overall in our secondary schools, that's something that we take very seriously. So I don't want you to hear my talking about some of the challenges as any way minimizing um, the import um, or, this, or the meaningfulness to us of what this data um, can, can tell us. Um, I have a couple of thoughts I just want to share about the, the, what I perceive that strikes me really, really um, strongly as the lack of overall trend. Um, it, it might have eluded folks that seven of our eight secondary principals um, have come into their roles since the 2016-2017 school year. So as a team in a complex landscape such as high school course catalog, you know, the, the different uh, subjects that are siloed by, by design and we're trying always to unsilo and create links between. Um, that's, a, that's a big thing to wrap around and to develop coherent um, collective efficacy, really, if I can borrow that, that term from before. Um, so that, that, is, that is currently eluding us. That's what this graph tells me as a leader of our secondary sites. Um, I'm just going to go to math because really the, the, the comments are the same. You know, one thing that might be helpful for, to the folks who are viewing this is to imagine these, these bars as vectors and to sort of, you know, even draw in a little vector or a little mini arrow b beneath all of them. And what you'll see at the end of doing that is, again, you'll be able to see some patterns emerge that are site-specific, but then you will see that if you took your eight vectors together, they are pointing in lots of different directions, and overall, that's why we are at maintained. So we still have work to do to figure out what is working, where we see things that are, that are working, and to unpack what are the practices that we need to adopt where we are not seeing things working um, in order to, to turn those trends around where we see those trends. So uh, ju just to conclude, um, in terms of where we are headed, um, we need to continue to, to focus on shifts in culture and practice. Um, this term, rigor, uh, for us, something that's coming, coming in as defining that is task predicting performance. So what that has, what that has elicited, I think, in our leaders and in in all of us, really, is if our students on a day-to-day -day basis are encountering activities, assignments that speak to a, a lower level of cognition, how, how would they be able to perform in an assessment that tests for exactly the opposite of that? Now, I know that sounds simple, but it's incredibly complex. Um, I, heard the, I heard the mention of, of, of rocket scientists earlier. Um, I would argue that in some ways we are, because we're grappling with all of the complexities that our community brings and meeting every child where they are and bringing them forward. That's an incredibly complex human endeavor. And when we talk about a sci uh, uh, embracing a level of cognition that is more stimulating, but that also begs the question of how are students that do have legitimate deficits in terms of their learning and aren't there yet, how we, how we raise the bar and at the same time simultaneously provide the support that they need. So, that is, a, that is a very much an instructional conversation, and it's one that our professionals are, are having every day um, through their school leadership teams and just in, in their day-to-day -day communication. Th that is becoming much more precise and it's becoming more clear. Um, the cycles of inquiry is something that we have uh, embraced as a way of, of, of trying to evaluate our effectiveness in, in shorter increments of time and trying to analyze data that comes out of um, our efforts. 
whether that's by way of student work or um, more formative measures like uh, some of what you've heard is the performance around Lexiles that, that, that give us a measure of reading, a measure of literacy. Um, creating high functioning collaborative teams. Uh, that is something that, that, that takes work and takes a lot of trust uh, to, to reference Ms. Carey's um, comment earlier. Um, we are having now teachers that are able to say, you know, I don't know how to do that. That's something that I don't quite know. And that's not easy for a professional to be able to admit to their colleagues. But increasingly, we are trying to find what those effective practices and high yield strategies really are. Um, we've named them in many instances, but naming them, knowing them, being trained on them is very different than seeing them through day in and day out with students that come to us as they are. Um, finally, partnerships for uh, focused collective efficacy. Uh, we do continue to rely on, on some very strategic partnerships that we've developed. Some of these are, uh, as a matter of fact, many of these are um, local or, or really focused toward specific initiatives. You see some of them in, uh, listed there. As we talk about, and you've heard some mention about multi-tiered systems of support, that is going to be our, our overall umbrella for how we merge the instructional and curricular space with our social-emotional learning. Um, that's not an easy task, but it's one that we've embraced and one that we've undertaken. Um, and finally, um, one thing uh, Ms. Munoz mentioned, uh, which I think is, it bears repeating here and highlighting, is our comprehensive plan for multilingual pathways, which we have now uh, dubbed our META. Uh, that promises to really um, foundationally reshape the way that we conceive of our multilingual learners and the way in which we can um, address not just, not view them for their deficits, but rather flip that paradigm and view them for the assets they bring. Uh, many of our students don't need to learn grit. They've lived with grit and they bring that to us. We just need to be able to acknowledge it, capitalize on it, and build from it. Um, so it's more than just instructional techniques. Um, in some ways, that's the easy part. But it is about how to train, how to effectively use them, and how to develop all of our efficacy around how we lead, how we teach, and how we uh, engage with our students. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and uh, just open it up for questions uh, from the board. And uh, Ms. Carey and I will do our best to provide you some responses. Board, Ms. Kepps. Thank you for that presentation and thanks to uh, the principals for being here and parents for, for being here as well. Uh, I had a question uh, that, about something that Ms. Carey said that I didn't understand even from last week, uh, meetings sort of um, set up to this conversation. You're saying that the bar keeps getting raised higher. Can you explain that progress made, especially when you're talking about 11th grade? If they're only tested in 11th grade, does that mean 11th graders are being tested compared to the, the last year's 11th graders or that individual 11th grade uh, if an individual 11th grader was, is being tested compared to how he or she was in 10th grade. Yeah, 11th grade is the tricky spot because really there's no reference, right. helpful reference point. <laughs> um, certainly not only five years in. We will start to be able to have reliable data because we'll have enough years of administration where we could look at a cohort of 11th grade students, how they perform and how they performed in their three through eight administrations, grade three through eight administrations, but we don't have that many years of data yet to reliably do that. But if we exempt the 11th graders for a moment, and I can answer your question yeah, sure. um, more directly. So let's say there's a score like 2451 that a student has to get as their scaled score on ELA to be standard met in um, fifth grade. These are invented numbers, please. <laughs> Um, then next year when they're in sixth grade, that scaled score that is the threshold for standard, standard met, it won't be 2451, it'll be, it'll be a higher bar. So even if we have s the same uh, proportion or slightly different numbers of students um, showing us that they are meeting exceeding standard, they're, they're not performing at the same place every year. I'm just simply pointing out that that doesn't mean they're not advancing or progressing, they're still progressing. If, if we stay the same in our percentage rates, if it's half our students are meeting standard, we have to also remember that that standard gets elevated every year as they progress through the grade levels. So I may have... Um, sure, okay, but, but they, it gets elevated because they're in the next grade. Correct, yes. So not because the, Correct. the bar yes. gets moved. 
it only gets moved because they're moving to a new grade level. Okay. Yes. All right. Well, I think, okay. So I appreciate that. Okay. That was, that was my sort of fundamental question. Um, I also just, so I thank you for stating up top, uh, Dr. Ramirez, that, you know, no one is satisfied. <laughs> I, I can say that I'm not, uh, and I know I can feel it, and I want to be very respectful of our principles and all the work, and, and, I, and yeah, you can feel it in, in your comments, both of you, about how much you care and how much this is uh, um, troublesome that, that our numbers aren't what we would hope um, sort of year after year. What's troubling for me and challenging is I, I've been sort of, as we talk about this, really seeking solid examples, like tangible examples. And, uh, you know, last two meetings ago, I said, what's sort of the secret sauce, right? And you use the word collective effic efficacy. And frankly, I just think that might be part of the challenge here, is that what does that mean? Can you give an example? And maybe we can just focus on the positive, some of the principals who are here and who've had these dramatic gains. Because I just, I understand that it's hard and it's big and it's complex. But I think if we just keep saying that, at least as a parent, it's very frustrating. <laughs> I want to say, I want to say, you know what? At Franklin, I've understood, and I just know this anecdotally. We've hired retired teachers to come in, and that's really helped. Or at, at such and such school, we changed our math curriculum, and that seems to really help. Like, I think that we need at least when we're communicating to parents, and I would have a hunch that we're com we're communicating to teachers, more solid examples of tangible things rather than these sort of concepts that I don't dismiss are super important, um, but this is a community and we're communicating something that's super important to uh, people who care. And I just, this report didn't do that for me. It didn't fly for me because I didn't, and I've been requesting this sort of time and time again to the superintendent and last two weeks ago, but I just, I wanna see that. I think that we'd actually have a real conversation about why is this working so well at some schools and we're still struggling at others? And uh, let's try to unpack it and not make it so sort of jargony and complicated, uh, even though I recognize that it is complicated. Another example would be, hey, uh, you know, we have, um, with our partnership in Calm, we're now focusing on ACEs, and that has seemed to really broken open this, this problem that we had in this one class in, at Harding. Okay, great, that, that tells you something. That gives you something, and I just can't imagine, I hope that the teachers are speaking in this way to each other, I bet they are when they get together. But I'm not hearing it here at the board level, uh, and this is really important because we need to communicate this, and this is sort of the preview of what we're looking for to communicate out to the broader wor world and the community here. So I, maybe I can just stop with my uh, urging of that um, and turn it over to you and perhaps any principals to say, just give us a tangible example of what's working. Thanks. I will offer up a, a thought from a, a combination of a leader practice, but it's also really a staff practice. Um, and I always have to provide a, a preamble. So if you'll just excuse me. Um, part of my reticence behind doing that is that it oversimplifies a very complex thing. And it, and it makes it seem as if one approach is going to be a solution across the board um, to, to some. So, but what I will offer up, um, and I can name uh, some specific practice practices across any one of our schools, but I'll focus on two that were highlighted there. Um, I'll focus on uh, Harding. Uh, one of the things that, um, that happens there, and I was just invited to this, is every, periodically, and I don't know if it happens uh, uh, monthly or biweekly, uh, Ms. Pinkley meets with her grade level um, teams and other people, interventionists, uh, school psych, it's a team. And they analyze down to a student by a, a slew of metrics um, that we have created a customized report for. So that happens like clockwork. And we are having an analysis and a discussion about down to the single student from everything that we know or that that school community knows about that child. It takes a lot of work to get there, a lot of trust, a lot of resources and effort. So what they do is they use the time that they are with their PE, um, art, and music teacher to use that time for very strategic and focused collaboration. Franklin. Ms. Kilgore, every day calendars herself 
for a morning and an afternoon session with one of her PLCs. So what you see, not because of that, but as one example of that, is that if you walk into a first grade classroom and the neighbor first grade classroom and the other uh, first grade classroom, you're gonna see very aligned expectations, very aligned content delivery, and very aligned pacing, which means how is the curriculum being delivered to kids? And both Harding and, and Franklin do this as well. They wanna make sure that they're interventionists that are giving kids the, the skills that they don't yet have in a very targeted way, also aren't inadvertently pulling away from time when they're supposed to be learning content standards. Um, that's, again, easy to say, difficult to do, because in the midst of all of these expectations that have shifted for us, there are two things that have remained relatively fixed, the number of school days and the number of instructional minutes. So we're having to work through very fixed parameters but in an effort to give you more clarity and precision to your question, I just wanted to highlight two leadership practices where, where they are really staff and school-based practices that are really uh, delving into deeper and deeper into what needs to happen for individual groups of kids or just for uh, sense-making between teams. Thank you for that. And then I'll go one step further then is this, and I, again, this is repeating some of my questions from two weeks ago, is, are those practices then shared with uh, the other principals as potential examples? Absolutely. Okay. Every single um, meeting that we have, I make it a point, I'm not always the greatest because there are so many things that come to us, but I try to prioritize on our face-to-face -face meeting examples where we are working together to be able to work through our leadership problems of practice and where these kinds of examples are being highlighted. This year, we have, we have uh, identified three principal collaborative days. And during those principal collaborative days, we were just discussing that very thing um, within our elementary cohort. Um, so those are the kinds of things that other people are gaining from, that staff is able to see and learn from each other. But we have to also acknowledge that every single school has got their own unique community, their own unique culture which isn't erased simply because there's a new principal um, or a different principal. So those are all very uniquely situated differently at every school. Thank you. So you believe like, if, so if I, if I, I would hope if I were a principal at a school that isn't, um, that is flatlined or, or gone in the wrong direction, would be actively seeking input from principals or other examples, you, you believe that those interactions are provided by the district on a regular basis? I believe that there are the opportunities to engage in that, but I will also tell you that every, because every school is unique, the priorities for every principal have to be very much nestled and situated within their learning community, which means that we may be further away from that as a reality in some of our schools than others, and there are very uh, real reasons why that happens. Sometimes, and the part that isn't always easy, is when a principal has to make difficult decisions evaluative decisions, personnel decisions. Those are, those are very much embedded into the work of our principals, and if that is their starting point for their school community, it's something that we have to acknowledge as being a factor in allowing the community and the culture to grow over time toward the practices that I just highlighted. Thank you for that. My last question is about communication to parents. How, um, how are these scores now that we have this, I know they're not yet um, official, and. Uh, complete, but how will they be communicated school by school? What kind of guidance is given by the district? I saw a NewsHawk article that kind of gave a thematic, but what, what sort of support are you providing and encouragement to make sure that uh, communication can be as clear as possible? Uh, down to the individual, and I'll, I'll speak for elementary, I certainly want to allow Ms. Ms. Carey to, to uh, focus on this as well. Um, down to the individual parent in terms of the performance of their own children, that is done by a score report that goes to each individual family. So that is something that we have already embarked upon and that we, uh, we are seeing. So that comes out of our district office. Now to the broader communication, um, obviously we as a district office um, have, have um, um, respond well to, to support us with some of those communication points, but locally down to the school level, 
Um, this is part of the reason that our principals are here. It's part of the reason that we wanted them to be um, active participants uh, in terms of their involvement so that they also understand how um, the public is receiving this information and uh, so that we can then focus on how does that message get delivered to parent stakeholder groups, to parent groups, committees, and then the community at large at each respective school. Thank you, and again, just a thank you to both of you, but also to our principals for staying this late. And as you can tell, I'm eager to hear about what's happening at your schools that you feel proud of. So please, um, please take this as an invitation. Thanks. Ms. Ward. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you for the reports. Thank you for the honesty um, and s deep gratitude to the principals and any teachers that are here for what they're trying to do. I, um, of course, found many of these scores disappointing. And I remember the days when I was a principal and I would just, you know, I mean, literally almost sit down and cry sometimes when the scores were so different from what I had hoped for, what I had cheered the kids on with and, and tried to provide for the teachers in, in terms of support. So uh, it's one thing for all of us to be disappointed. It's quite another thing for principals and teachers to feel disappointed. So with that, I was very, I wanted to share a couple of thoughts. Uh, I'm, I'm very um, encouraged by the concept of collective efficacy. And so I did a little bit of reading on it, and um, I do think that this is really the most powerful way to approach um, and to combat our disappointment. Um, because the definition I saw was this shared belief that they can overcome the challenges and execute a course of action for success, according to John Hattie in 2016, is three times more powerful and predictive than socioeconomic status, prior achievement, home environment, parental invo involvement, and student motivation, persistence, and engagement. So this shared belief is so so incredibly powerful. And if you don't have that shared belief, we all know that it starts to look like burnout because teachers and principals begin to think that they can't do it. And um, so with that, I just uh, have some questions and I would love us to spend more time over time understanding if our teachers believe that they have what they need in terms of training, materials, data, planning time, collaborative time, and feedback loops. Because those are the things that, to me, make a huge difference in teacher efficacy and the collective efficacy of a school. So just wanted to offer up a brief comment. Um, obviously, Ms. Ford, having your um, expertise and background um, as, a, as a member of this board is uh, incredibly helpful. As you had alluded to, um, it can be, um, the principalship can be a very isolating uh, experience. Um, but one of the things that uh, these numbers won't bear out, and I think I'm speaking for Ms. Carey, is that we have done, um, and our team, our services team, our, our ETS, our cabinet, we have prioritized wanting to uh, develop uh, strong professional ties within our principal groups. Um, I'd like to believe they genuinely like each other. And, and, and I, I, I say that in jest, but I, I, I see plenty of evidence that they are reaching out uh, to each other, learning from each other, and using one another as supports. Because um, this is not easy work, as you well know. Um, but I'm, I'm very heartened by your commentary um, that, um, that we are uh, culturally on the right path. Um, to your questions, we have, we have other data points that we would love to share with you in another time that speak to some of this um, that we've tried to respond to uh, coming from our teachers and coming from our, our leaders. So um, but thank you for, for sharing your comments. Uh, so to clarify, you want to share things that are different from the list that I gave you that I think make a difference? with teachers? No, no, ways in which, I'm sorry, let me clarify, ways in which um, we have tried to elicit feedback from our teachers okay. um, around some of these very um, um, topics that you aptly described. And 
thank you. And I, I guess the other thing I really thought about was Pedro Noguera and the comments that he made and the power of his message. And I just wondered, I just want to put it out there for my colleagues on the board and for the cabinet that I, I wonder if it's possible at all for us to become part of uh, his transformative uh, approach to schools, the group he has at UCLA. I think it's, it's so powerful and I know so many people that feel like it changed their professional lives, which is to join the transformation um, cohort. We have... Um uh, yeah, I mean, we we received incredible feedback about uh, Dr. Noguera's um, um, presentation, his speech, his kind of call to action for us. Um, I know that in my neck of the woods, uh, Oxnard Union has formally partnered with him and his group. Um, so at some point in time, it would maybe be worth our, our time to see what kind of work they're doing. This is very recent, but um, uh, just to see it uh, in, a, in a, close, a close neighbor. Thanks. I think, you know, as you said, like, you know, Dr. Noguera and then also with the uh, multilingual pathways, you know, having expert consultants. I know um, yesterday I learned from the many uh, team leaders that they had about the different school districts and what they've done um, and what their experiences have been. Um, and I think that, you know, in terms of the data with our local schools and how we could take you know, um, take the best, the benefit, you know, benefit from their experience um, is helpful. And also partnership with someone, you know, like Dr. Noguera is very, as a school district. Thank you. I'd just like to echo and certainly agree with the comments that my colleagues have made. I, I just have a cluster of questions. I, I just want to first share my appreciation for the principals are here, the cabinet who's working on this stuff that's daily, putting that hard work in, and sometimes the numbers don't really bear out what's really underneath the root of, of making it strong and moving it. And sometimes when it's only moving in a small bit, then it feels like it's not at where we want it to be, and it certainly is not, but it, it doesn't then always bear out the effort to even do that sometimes, given the fact that they're not just coming in to sit down to learn how to read math, or I mean to do math and to read. There are other things that are being brought in in terms of how are we treating in a different way that schools now are having to, how are we treating the whole child, how are we treating the whole family. So there's so much more than just those simple things that maybe have moved the metrics in the past. So I want to appreciate that and acknowledge that that happens, certainly has to go um, into that. But I, the question I have is, are there, do we compare ourselves to similar districts with similar, you know, outcomes here? You know, I don't know that we've had that here, but how do we do that and how do we compare so that it doesn't feel like it's isolated in Santa Barbara Unified that these issues are happening? Yes, thank you. You're, you're right that the, uh, the numbers don't, don't yet, yet bear out our effort, but I'm very confident they will because even though I made that, uh, that I pointed that out earlier that we have a, a relatively new team of secondary principals um, in terms of being in the principal seat a lot of our folks who are in the secondary principals chair have been a part of our district for a long time and I'm kind of looking out there but I can say without even looking at them that I know they feel like I do that we are better positioned than ever and that we've developed more momentum than we've ever experienced certainly as a collective group um, when it comes to being really targeted about um, how this data provides the entry point we need to having all of those conversations that that together we're sort of commenting on are the are the critical components of of collective efficacy. Or I'm very excited about how excited you are about that, <laughs> um, as you saw from last from last board meeting. It is, but it is an elusive. I I, I want to also acknowledge and validate that, that that's an elusive construct. Um, it, it is challenging to unpack. Um, so I asked this question of Eileen Strauss when she visited because I knew as a principal myself, I was really, uh, she sits on, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Matsuoka, but the State Board of Education. And um, I, was, I was a principal myself and I was very interested in similar schools, more interested in similar schools than anything else. Um, and so uh, the CDE is not doing that. They are decidedly not providing that to schools the way that they did in the former accountability era. Um, the answer she provided was, it's largely because of the emphasis on year-over-year -year growth within your context, within your site context and within your local context. 
But that does not mean that we cannot do that homework on our own. Um, and a lot of the principals that I talk with do do that homework on their own, but it's just not served up the way it used to be served up. Right. Um, it has a little bit of overlap with what Ms. Caps was asking about earlier. You know, how do I learn from my peers, um, both those who are who are near to me, because there's some things that we have that are that might be in that might be that we might have in common, but also where we have differences. There's a lot of learning to be done with where we have differences, um, and what what either similar th outcomes we're seeing despite our differences. I mean, there's lots of ways to be to be analyzing things, but um, it is very very valuable to be able to find similarly situated schools. And, and do those comparisons. And, and the more mature you become in the principal seat, the more intriguing that becomes to you yeah. for the exact reason I think that you're suggesting. Well, I, I certainly appreciate that too. And I, I want to also say just going into our third and also into our fourth year, how much seeing the, the just the energy and, and the attitude around it, because sometimes that's a huge part about attitude, how we're going to do that. So you see those numbers moving and how we learn when we learn better and we know better and then we improve that through evaluative processes and then learning from each other, then we're able to improve our practices. So I want to acknowledge that too, just the growth over time. You know, we still have the difficulty of getting numbers where we want them and, and, and that's a good thing and not being satisfied. So that means we're going to continue to, you know, do um, hard work and, and okay. you know, striving to ensure that our students have the best learning environment and giving them what they need and certainly supporting our teachers and our principals in, in that effort so I just wanted to acknowledge that the hard work that goes in every day because it's not as simple because there's so much being brought in that we need to take care of and sometimes that becomes a priority of the health and wealth and safety safety of our students before that you know in terms of that so just want to acknowledge that so any okay Miss Ford I, I just feel compelled to share with all of you a, an anecdote from my experience in Los Angeles and that was that I had I was responsible for 12 schools and they were not diverse in any way. They were 95% low socioeconomic and 99% Latino. Um, but when the scores came out, uh, there were two of the 12 which were substantially higher than all the rest of the schools in terms of their test scores. So we asked the principals about their secret sauce. What was it? And uh, it kind of, uh, it sort of blew me away and blew everyone else away, but the both of the schools had higher scores in math than they had in reading, but both reading and math were higher. And they said one thing, they focused 100% on reading. And I think after you think about the conversations that we've, and comments we've had tonight, that you cannot, um, you, can't you can't ignore the power that reading gives you not only in school and scholastic success, but in testing success. Okay. Additional comments, Mr. Watsoka, or you? Uh, President Sims Moton, to your question about you know comparables, uh, I do miss that similar schools uh, tool. Um, I find myself you know, poking into the state website to look at comparable K-12 districts. Uh, it is, what was good about that metric is they took into account all of the aspects that made up a school district, um, socioeconomic status, um, all the factors that make schools similar or different. Um, but I, you know, my experience in the Bay Area, I know quite a few of the districts that could be comparable. Um, I think that might help us calibrate our our disappointment, our frustration, like what's going on in other districts. Uh, I'm really interested in to see how the state data comes out um, because we're now five years in. Is the state, you know, trending upwards or are they running into the same flat line? Um, not that that's an excuse for what we see here, but it is helpful to calibrate to other places. So, um, and then the, you know, the districts in Southern California, I don't know as well, but uh, I think we can, uh, look for districts that have a similar setting to ours. Thank you very much for that report. Okay, so we have come to at least a pause at the end of this meeting. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> that was just great, a lot of data to, you know, to absorb, so all good things. So um, we are going to be, are there future agenda items that we haven't had on our special events that we need to add to that board? Okay, board members, we know what those are. Uh, any coming events that we need to remind ourselves of? I think all the back to school nights are finished, right? We're done. Okay. One more. One more. La Cuesta. La Cuesta. Okay. All right. 
I would just right. also say that we have on October 5th the reunion of all of the classes of Santa Barbara High School. <laughs> Once a dawn, always a dawn. And I'm, I think it's going to be a great event. Be yes, 10 to 4 a.m. <laughs> Okay, be sure to add that. Okay, so we will adjourn back to closed session board members so that we can finish our discussion, but our next board meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, October 8th, 2019. Thank you so much for everyone for staying and participating in tonight's meeting.